session, but we had no reportable action on 4A, and we've continued 4B and C until uh, after the meeting. So that brings us to, and welcome everybody, thank you for being here tonight. Um, that brings us to the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you could all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, and just a reminder, we are, uh, as we usually do, film and live stream these meetings on our YouTube channel. And also there's coffee and some cookies out in the back kitchen area uh, if you'd like to partake during the meeting. So that brings us to item number six, which is public comments. Do we have any public comment? This is an uh, opportunity to uh, comment on any matter that is not on the agenda tonight. So, yes, come on up, please. And if you could fill out a speaker slip uh, after you're done speaking, yes. that'd be great. If you could just introduce yourself and go okay. ahead. Yeah, right there. I'm not just sure if this you. is the exact appropriate time. Uh, Kevin Platt, Battalion Chief with Contra Costa Fire, and here to give a brief update for the fire district, specifically to do with Lafayette. Okay, that's great. So we, uh, public comment is, is three minutes. Yep. If you could do it in three minutes, that, that'd be fantastic. Or less. Thank you very much. So, not sure if you're all aware, but Fire Station 16 is under construction uh, in Lafayette, nearing com completion, expected at the end of April, beginning of May. And Fire Engine number 16 is open already, co-located with number 15 on Mount Diablo. So, you have two fire state, one fire station being built, and this one's doubled up right here on 15. They're actually on a wreck right now on 24. Um, so I believe you probably have been alerted to all that, but they wanted me to come and make sure you guys were aware and offer any questions if you had any. Okay, okay. any questions for the speaker? I'll just say thank you very much. Um, I, I mean, it was great news when we heard from the new chief. Um, and, you know, I think the community has been waiting eagerly for, uh, for what's about to come and what, what's happening, what's about to come with the station being fully operational. Absolutely. And you know, we're very, very fortunate to have the best in the business in Confire supporting our community. So thank you on behalf of the entire city. We are happy to help. Okay, thanks. Thank All right, any other public comment? Okay, great. Seeing none, we'll move on to um, presentations, 7A. Our Administrative Services Director, Tracy Robinson. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the two newest members of the City of Lafayette. Um, first, we have our new Assistant Engineer, Danielle Sanchez. Uh, Danielle is a graduate of Cal Poly, just like your Public Works and Engineering Director. And um, we, <laughs> we turned her from the dark side. She used to work in the private sector on development projects. Um, and she's especially interested in helping us with our clean water program. We're very happy to have her working on that. Um, and apparently, although we haven't seen them in real life, she has two very cute chow chow dogs, which we're hoping she'll bring to the office soon. So welcome, Danielle. Next, we have uh, Patrick Murray. He is our new construction inspector. Uh, Patrick is a licensed general contractor. He's a retired uh, police officer. Um, would he also managed the code enforcement unit, so I'm sure that's going to come in very handy in the new position. He is also a longtime resident of the city of Lafayette and a graduate of St. Mary's College. Um, and he says it's okay to call him Pat. So right. Welcome, Pat. Welcome, Patrick and Danielle, to uh, an incredibly awesome staff, and we look forward to working closely with you, tight-knit family here, so thank you very much, and a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Tracy, very much. Um, so we'll go on to 7B, and very pleased to welcome Director John Coleman from the East Bay Municipal Utility District to provide an update to the city. Mr. Coleman, welcome. Great. Thank you, Mayor Burks, council members. I've not met either Susan or Stephen. Look forward to working with you. I left my business cards, so if you need to reach me, uh, 
I know Teresa and Mike and Cameron have been able to do that frequently. So my name is John Coleman. I represent uh, the city of Lafayette, the portions of Walnut Creek, Pleasant Hill that are in the East Famous Service Area, all the way down through the San Ramon Valley and then the east side of San Ramon of 680 and been very fortunate to be able to represent all these great people for so many years. I'm going to go a little bit of, over our water system here. Um, I've done this in the past. Uh, we get our water from snowmelt. We've had a lot of that this year, about 165% of normal, which is phenomenal. And um, the water is stored at Party Reservoir, and then it goes through 90 miles of aqueduct pipelines through the Delta, and originally by our treatment plant near Larky Park, and then to Lafayette, and to Arinda, and distributed throughout our area. We serve about 1.4 million people in our service area, and we have 325 square miles of service area. So, it rained, it snowed, it's raining again. Nobody thought it would now, but it is. We're in phenomenal shape. Uh, we are literally releasing a lot of water to make sure when the snow does start melting that we don't have flood issues on the McCullumy River for downtown, downstream in Lodi and elsewhere. And as you can see, we're a little bit above percent of average, a little bit underneath the percent of capacity. That again is because we're want to make sure that we have adequate space to store all that water and um, it's going to be a banner year. We've actually brought in about $6 million in hydropower generation so far as a result of that and that's also good for everybody. So into September, we look at September 30th, what is our water supply situation? 2019, we're full. We're going to be at 630,000 acre feet, thousand acre feet and you can see when we're in the midst of our drought that ended in 2016, how far we were down in our supply situation and how desperate it was. We had a good year and then the last couple of years, even a little last year was below average. Uh, the usage was below average as well. But 2019, we're full, we're brimming and uh, can't wait to be able to be in the same situation hopefully next year. We have many long-term water supply partnerships uh, with East Bay Mud. We built the Freeport Regional Water Project with the County of Sacramento. It's a $542 million project. We paid 48%. The County of Sacramento paid 52%. That's our insurance policy that allowed us during the drought to actually be able to transfer water from Yuba County, Placer County, bring it into our service area. Had we not had that in place in 2015, not knowing what the next water year was going to be, it would have been most likely illegal to water anything outside your house because we did not know what the next year was going to bring. So we're able to bring the transfers in and we're also looking at an agreement tomorrow with Placer County Water to enter into, into a long-term water agreement. So in future drought years, which will happen, we'll be able to have that water be able to bring it into our system. We're looking at uh, desalinization as a possibility in the Bay Area. And we have entered into an agreement in San Joaquin County for uh, storing water underground. And that took many years to come to terms because of uh, long-term hostility to East Bay Mud uh, in the valley. And we're also working with the Conocost Water District on the expansion capabilities at Los Vaqueros. And I'm hoping that we do it because, again, that will help both, it'll help the entire county to be able to do that and to be linked together that way. Um, McCullumy River, we have had a huge success story on the return of our salmon. Even during the mist and height of the drought, we were the only river system in the state of California that exceeded the average for return on salmon. We spend about $5 million a year on our fish hatchery with California Fish and Wildlife, and uh, returns have been phenomenal. And again, it's an investment that the board decided to make. It actually helped us when we were in the midst of the drought when the State Water Resources Control Board said everybody's got to cut, 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 and you got to do this, this, and this, and they're going to wait. We're making this investment. We've actually improved our fish hatchery operations where other parts of the state was not the case, and that benefited us actually in our negotiations with the State Water Board and State Fish and Wildlife Service as a result. We're investing dollars. Yes, everybody knows that we pay a lot for water, and People do not like rates, I understand that, because I get a lot of emails and phone calls about it. But our system is old. In some cases, it's over 100 years old, the pipes. We're having to uh, go through and make sure that we capitalize the pipes. 
We're investing for resilience. We know that there's going to be a major earthquake at some point. It was in the newspaper, I think, today or yesterday in the Contra Costa Times talking about the vulnerability of that. We were actually the first water utility in the United States after Loma Prieta, and we spent about $130 million to, uh, on, uh, on our water system to make sure that when it does happen, we're not down for as long as we would be otherwise. So our big issues are safety, reliability, and water quality. And we've also been able to, with our money that we've generated, we've put aside $95 million in our rate stabilization fund. So that will help in future droughts, and it's also going to help us if a major event does take place, we'll have capital available to tap into right away, not waiting for FEMA or perhaps the state of California to come, come to terms here. Our service area, we have five local reservoirs. Uh, one is in this community, I think, but it's not a drinking water reservoir. It's classified by that, but it is not used for drinking water. But Briones, Upper San Leandro, Chabot, and uh, I should know it off the top of my head. Uh, whatever. There's five of them. So that is about eight, seven to eight percent of our water is local runoff that goes into these reservoirs, then it's distributed. What's important to remember, we have 4,200 miles of pipeline. So that's essentially walking from or flying from San Francisco to New York to Chicago. That's how much responsibility of pipeline we have. And again, some of it is over 100 years old. And so we're trying to make sure that we are prepared and uh, it uh, takes a lot of time and money to do just that. Our pipeline rebuild, we used to only sp uh, do about five to 10 miles a year in um, pipeline rebuilding. Our goal in, is 15 miles in fiscal year 19 and 20 to get to 20 miles by F year 21. And you're gonna say, wait, you got 4,200 miles of pipeline. That's gonna take a long, long time to do it. Well, hopefully with the pipes that we're putting in now and we're looking at new technology with pipes, that are much more advanced, they will last a lot longer in the process. But it does cost more to go in and fix a pipe that breaks versus going in where we know there's problems and doing and fixing it ahead of time versus waiting for a major break, which happens. And every morning, all the board members get an email from uh, the staff, tells us of all the breaks that occurred in the last 24 hours, the city, the cross streets, and approximately how many gallons of water were lost. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it, they're trying to keep us up on that. We're also looking at a timeline of major capital projects of water treatment plants. And you're going, wow, it's, why are you fixing all your water treatment plants? Well, EPA, Department of Health Services, everybody says you gotta do this, this, and this. In order to comply and not be fined, we need to upgrade also to make sure that we're in compliance. We're doing aqueduct ref uh, lining. So we have, again, three aqueducts coming down from Party to here. We also have the Lafayette Aqueduct, which has leaked over the years, and so that is going to be fixed, is uh, coming up here. And we have towers and tunnels that we need to make sure that are uh, operational, and again, meet all the current safety standards and requirements that were brought down both by the state and federal government. And open cut reservoirs, which you're well aware of, I think Leland is one that we voted on, I know it is one, we voted on in December. It was controversial here, but it's, uh, and be redone and be completed, I believe, in 2024. And so there's a lot of capital improvement projects that we're working on, as well as large pipeline di diameters that we need to work on to make sure that in the event of an earthquake or another disaster, um, that we are able to deliver water uh, to our customers in a timely way and people are not without water for too long. So our costs are not fixed, nor are our revenues. About 92% of our costs are fixed, 8% variable. The variable is really chemicals and energy when you get right down to it. Uh, if we sell more water, we're going to use more chemicals and more energy in order to uh, do that. And our revenue is about 72% fixed, 20, 28% fixed, 72% variable. This is actually where I have a difference from my colleagues. I get along great with them on the board. I would rather see our fixed revenues at a higher percent and we actually had this discussion at our board workshop on budgets recently, because when we do go into a drought and we tell everybody to cut back, our revenue stream dries up. And then everybody goes, oh, well, you're gonna reduce rates after the drought. No, we're not. Uh, that doesn't happen, I could say it is, but I'd be lying. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that revenue stream dries up. If we had higher on the fixed revenue, that would mean there'd be less of a financial impact coming out of the drought or why we're in the drought. 
So we've had healthy debate at East Bay Mud about that, and right now I'm not on the winning side of that issue, but I think more people are starting to see that it does have financial impact because it means we, can do, we can't do some of the things they want to do because we don't have the revenue stream. Our water supply. Well, take a look at that. Look at the red line shows the population growth. That's about a 30% increase since 1970. The dark line on top is water consumption on a per day use. It's down about 70%. So when people go, oh, we shouldn't do this or that, and you hear this during the drought, can't have this built or that built, the reality of the situation is we're using much less today than we were in the 1970s when the population was 30% uh, lower than it is in today. And a lot of it is people done a phenomenal job on conservation, hardware, we go to the store to buy things. It's all conservation and the rebates that we have as well. But it does have an impact on our budget. Our budget. So we have a healthy budget, $2.34 billion. Uh, we do a two-year budget and um, gives you an idea of most of it is water, 86%. But what it does show you is where the money is going. About 67% is for capital investment related, 21% for debt service, 33 for operations, 46 for capital appropriations. We're actually moving away from less from bond money and more towards pay as you go. So that will uh, actually long term have be healthier for our books and, and the ratepayers as well in that process. And this is where some of the money is going, so you can see it on the end oh, from fiscal year 20 to 21, and what the impact is in terms of our grand total of $2.3 billion that we'll be spending over the next two years. And um, we had initially projected a 7% rate increase in fiscal year 2021 and five years they're out. Uh, we have been able, staff has been able to do a phenomenal job of watching what we spend. So now they're coming to us with a six and a quarter percent rate increase, even though our water sales are still depressed. If they were higher, it would be actually probably less of a percent increase. Uh, but it's coming, it's being forecasted and proposed, which we'll be voting on later this uh, year to be a six and a quarter percent. Um, so we're trying to do the process. We are going through the 218. We've had two public hearing, two public workshops in this process, and we're establishing what we need to do in order for charge the customers for customer class, which we're required to do by law as well. Those are the two workshops. The mailing goes out April 26th. We will hold a public hearing on June 11th. Assuming that the board does approve those rates, they take effect on July 1, which is our fiscal year. So if you have any questions, that's my contact information. Uh, if you call me on my cell, I think I'm pretty good at returning phone calls and emails, um, and for that matter, for the public as well. I'd also like to thank Mayor Burks. Uh, I was not aware that we had a gate issue at the Lafayette Reservoir. <laughs> and so you raised it, and it's been fixed. Thank you for uh, bringing that to my attention. But a lot of the things that we do, there's a lot going on in a lot of things. And Catherine Horn, who's here, who's sort of our district person out and about, she does a phenomenal job you know, relaying information to me. But if there's an opportunity, whether it be a council meeting or another meeting to go out and speak to a group, I'd love to do it and be able to make sure that I can uh, represent you to the best of my ability. Great. Any questions? I, maybe I could just start by thanking you. On the gate issue that you know, Karen Mulvaney, who a lot of you know, raised it, and I, I think it was on Facebook, my Facebook site, and it's, it's those little things, and uh, Mr. C Director Coleman jumped right on it and had staff get it taken care of. But it's those little things, I think, that really make a difference uh, in our community and shows that we're serviced by a phenomenal utility district. And we've got a phenomenal director who, who does really believe in Lafayette and is, and is here for us. So I'd like to thank you for that. Well, I grew up in Lafayette. Uh, I know I'm you past did. chamber president <laughs> of Lafayette. Um, may, I've just got just, just one question, and sure. you, may have, you may have answered it. On the capital projects, on the, the earthquake stability issue with our yeah. reservoir tower, Oh yeah, we are. Uh, we have submitted some designs to, depart, uh, to Division of Dam Safety to look at to evaluate. Um, it is, if it were to collapse during a major seismic earthquake, would there be flooding downtown? No, the amount of flow out of the pipe is, I think, seven cubic feet per second. Oh. 
Okay. So it's a minimal, it'd be like a heavy rainstorm in the creek. But the fear is, you know, if that were to happen, the fear that could be started, and quite frankly, we need to make sure it's seismically safe. We're coming up with some designs. I know people want it kept looking the same way it is. I understand that, but, and I'll be honest with you, I'm also gonna look at the cost, and what it costs in, term, in terms of deciding what is the right design. Um, yes, it's iconic for a lot of reasons, and, um, but the bottom line is if it's $100 million more to have the same design versus one that's functional, in all, all good honesty, I, don't, I couldn't support that because that's about a 7% rate increase mm -hmm. to do that. And that's just not good public policy. I'm hoping to come up with a design that either keeps the integrity of the current structure or builds it to what is similarly there today. Okay. If you could just keep us up to date sure, on absolutely. timelines and, you know, sort of, you know, insights into where your staff is going around some of the designs, I think our public would, would appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, we can as make much sure as possible. That. We can put it on our website. We can do some, some stuff on social media. Okay. Um, that would be great. We'll do that. Appreciate the answer there. Yeah. So any uh, vice mayor? Anderson? So John, thanks for coming as you always do. It's always a good report, whether it's a good year for water or not. So great report. I do appreciate the water tower issue, the fact that you're even going forward with different ideas than what was proposed originally is, thank you, that's, that's our interest at heart, and I appreciate that. I was wondering about the Los Vaqueros project. If, in fact, you got involved in that, would you be blending water with CCWD, or would that just be a separate project? Do you know? It would point? be blending, putting water in, and it would be a backup reserve supply of water and we would be treating it similar to what our water comes off the Sacramento River for our Freeport project. Okay. We're upgrading our facilities uh, in the event we need to do it, that in the future. Uh, I think in, in this case it's also good public policy. It's something that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen and when or how long a future drought is with climate change, but the fact is we go through droughts, we went through a very long drought. Um, if we have the ability where we can tell people, yes, you use water reasonably, you know, cut back 15% versus no, you can't use water, you're allocated 30 gallons per person per day, that's not going to fly either, and people would have a right to be upset. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from uh, Director Coleman? Uh, yeah, Councilmember Bliss. Yeah, a couple quick ones. Um, so, um, just want to echo the thanks for you being out here, sure. speaking to Council this evening. Is this on? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, great. Um, as a resident of Lafayette, obviously I get to interact with East Bay Mud in various ways as a user and also um, the East Bay Mud properties and encountering East Bay Mud staff pretty regularly and just it's always just been a great agency to deal with and on all fronts. So thank you for... A little closer. Yeah. Um, is that better? That's better, yeah. Okay, right, thanks. Um, I was just saying it's a, East Bay Mud's always been a great agency to deal with and encounter in various ways in the community. Um, I just had a question, uh, two quick questions. Um, you mentioned that there was $6 million in hydropower revenue. J in that's so far this year. We right. budgeted $3.8 million. Okay. And t given the fact that there's a lot of changes going on in the power market these days mm -hmm. on various fronts, can you put that, the general expectation for this year in context? Do you expect, I mean, I assume that revenue is up from prior years, but what do you foresee as the trend going forward in terms of hydropower as a revenue source well, for the district? It would, if we're in a good year, it's going to be great to have it. Although, ironically, the, this, when the MCE is buying that power, they're buying it at less than they would during a dry year right. because mm -hmm. they need the green power. Uh, the also, uh, actually, Part E doesn't get counted as green power because of the size of the reservoir, which is, I think, a decision Sacramento needs to fix. It's already there. It's different than building a giant reservoir because when Party was built, it was the largest reservoir in the country at the time in the 1920s. And so it's considered a large reservoir. Lar and so that's not considered, quote unquote, green power as a result. Even though it's there today, it's producing power. Mm -hmm. And that's a policy change that needs to happen in Sacramento. We're going to see more of it. We're actually the only water, waste, wa we're both wastewater too on the other side. We're the only utility in the United States that actually produces more power than we use between methane, uh, hydropower, and uh, we're going into solar as well now. Okay. So 
but we're, I think there's one other company in Austria or Australia that falls in that category as well. But yeah, it's gonna be a bigger future and it's gonna be dictated by AB321, I believe, mm -hmm. and doing more green energy. And it's a question of where's it gonna come from? Thanks. And my other question just has to do with the chart you showed, really helpful chart showing just the aggregate per capita use and that trend over time right. going downward. Um, is that chart showing residential plus commercial, just like overall? That's, that is demand? residential, it's per capita use, correct, oh, it's, residential only? Yeah, it's residential it's, strictly. Okay, and so any sense you have of um, the work that the district's doing? I know there's, there's a lot of emphasis focused on conservation and efficient use on the residential front, and with good reason, right, because we're all making choices as residents every day about how to use water, how to conserve water. Um, is there anything the district does in terms of working with commercial customers? Oh, absolutely. We and have, what are some of the highlights there? That well, we have coming up, I believe in May, it's we highlight the uh, private side and public, non-residential, that actually have made the greatest strides in water conservation. We have an aggressive uh, water conservation budget, not only for homeowners and cities, but also for the public and private sac sector as well. And their usage is down in addition to the single family homeowners. It's just down. And I need to tell people, you can use your water. If it goes in the gutter, you're probably using too much. But you can use water in your yard, it's okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, Any other questions, yeah. Yeah, real quick, um, you mentioned going into solar. Can, can you give me an example of what you may be doing? Well, we have entered into some agreements on solar. I've asked staff to take a look at um, up at, by Lake Comanche off of Highway 12. We have a lot of land there, and one side of the dam actually has a southern exposure. Can we actually go into more solar agreements there in order to generate the solar power, and then we would sell it uh, most likely to the MCE? Okay. Okay, I th uh, do we have any, I know we have one public comment for uh, this topic, and if we have additional public comment, please fill out a yellow speaker card. But Can I raise one thing? If you, yeah. Not related to Spay Mud. Yes. Thank you for your email today, by the way. Okay. Um, some of you are aware I got hit by a red light runner Friday morning going to work on Pleasant Hill Road, leaving my house. I don't understand, and today I get the, my insurance company said I'm 100% not at fault, but the uh, two police officers came very promptly, good, one on a bike, one in a car, and I said, are you gonna cite the red light runner? And they said, no. And I'm going, well, an off-duty cop was at the red light. He, he told you that this guy ran the red light. And they said, well, we'll let the insurance companies decide, then we'll decide whether we cite him. I don't understand that as a policy. And then I asked for, are you going to do a report? And they said, no. And when I contacted my insurance company, they asked if there was a report. I said, no. And when I contacted the guy who hit me, his insurance company, he asked if there's a report, and I said, no. So I don't, it's, it doesn't make sense why, again, the, the officers were very professional, they were promptly, but why they wouldn't cite somebody when you have a witness to what happened, and secondarily, why was there no police report? Because if he chooses not to talk to his insurance agent, which he has not done as of this afternoon, they may not decide that uh, I'm at partially at fault, yeah. Yeah. So, which doesn't make any sense. So that was my one thing. No, I, you know, and I, I saw the photos of your car. I'm very glad you're okay. And, and for you to be here tonight is amazing. So first and foremost, I'm glad you're okay. If I could maybe ask the interim city manager to, to uh, touch base with Chief Aldrett and, and follow up and then follow up with Director Coleman, that would be fantastic. That would be awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. And you have somebody in public to talk about? We do have okay. one public speaker right. slip who I think has a, a question for you. So it's oh, Lynn Hedane. Right here. Yes. Lynn, would you like to come up? Can, we need to record you, if that, yeah. Oh. Thanks, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just, Lynn Hedane, 649 Los Palos Drive, used to be right around the corner from John's house. Um, I just wanted to know when you're going to be repairing the East Bay Mud Aqueduct. That's ah. been my perpetual question for I don't know how many years, and you, first I heard, uh, what was it? 2015, and then it went to 2017. I mean, uh, 1917. There was what a slide up there. 19, where am I? 2017. Yeah. Okay. We actually was listed under there under. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes. 
Well, LEF one? Yeah. 2023. So what? And how much of it are you going to do? We're going to fix the entire pipeline that needs to be replaced. It's it's very frustrating when we have a leak, and I understand public goes into drought. My God, you're not fixing your own leaks, and and I understand that. Uh, we have yes, we have a large budget. We also have a lot of pipeline and reservoirs and pumping stations. So it falls in the priority of which is the most severe and what and being fixed. Okay, but it is going to be done. It's right up there. It's the third, the Lafayette one green bar. We'll cross our fingers. All right, thank you, Lynn. All right, thank you. All right, Director Coleman, thank you very much. All right, and no further public comments, so we will advance to item eight, which is our consent calendar, which we typically will vote on in one single motion, unless a member of the council would like to pull an item or a member of the public would like to pull an item. Do we have any items that our council would like to pull? None on, uh, any on this side? Yes, Councilmember Geringer? No? None? Councilmember Bliss? None? Okay. I'd be happy to move the consent calendar. I second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. So we will now move to uh, item 9A, uh, a report from our interim city manager on MTC's CASA Compact and Tri-Valley City's Housing and Policy Framework. Thank you, Mayor Burks. Good evening, Council and members of the public. I wanted to give you an update on the efforts of Contra Costa Cities to wrap its, uh, their arms around the CASA Compact as well as the legislation, legislation that has resulted from the compact uh, you had a joint meeting in March with the uh, La Mirinda cities, and um, you directed the city managers to draft a letter uh, outlining our concerns on uh, the CASA Compact, and we are doing that. The uh, mayors are getting together this uh, Thursday to talk about it. Uh, additionally, the Tri-Valley five communities of Dublin, Pleasanton, Livermore, uh, San Ramon, and Danville have been in the forefront of uh, uh, reviewing the CASA Compact and pending legislation. And together, they have come up with a really good report on the impacts of the legislation on local jurisdictions. That report was reviewed by the Public Managers Association in March and April, uh, in February and March, and the public managers have uh, have asked for a countywide framework similar to what the Tri Valley cities have developed. We have completed that work and will be discussing that this Thursday. The intent is to really rally all the cities around the, the protection of local land use control to identify concerns that we all share and also to identify in the pending bills those concepts that we can rally behind. And um, I hope to bring that report, the, the countywide framework with accompanying resolution either at the end of this month or early next month. CASA has, uh, is, is behind us. What we really need to focus on is are the bills that the legislature is currently considering, and there are a number of them. Uh, so there are a couple of things that this, the public managers are doing to rally the troops, so to speak. One is we're promoting the April 24th uh, League legislation Legislative Action Day. It's a day where all the elected officials from local jurisdictions are invited to Sacramento to meet with the legislators on, on various bills that are of interest to them. Uh, a good thing is that on that very same day, one of the most impactful bills, SB 50, which is the Wiener Bill, will be uh, considered by the Senate Government Relations Committee. So the League is working on a way to get all the elected officials at the hearing to participate in, in that hearing. 
SB 50, as many of us know, is, I would say, much more impactful and has a much more negative impact on local governments than AB 2923 did. AB 2923, or the BART bill last year, focused on BART-owned lands. And so we were able to quantify what kind of impact it would have, because BART owns a discrete number of properties. AB uh, SB 5 really covers land within a half mile of the BART station. And so I wanted to just demonstrate to you what that means for Lafayette. So this is the BART station, and the circle is a half mile radius. And I just highlighted some local streets so we know where, we're, where the impact is. Brook Street to the south, it extends almost up to Risa Road. This is Dolores Drive. Up north goes, this is Nordstrom Lane, so it covers Happy Valley Glen, and to the east, this is First Street. So land within this area is vulnerable uh, by, uh, to development, to higher density development. And some of the key features of SB 50 is that uh, it removes any local uh, control or local standards and allows, us, allows increases in density, in height, in floor area ratio. Additionally, it, it greatly reduces the parking requirements for any projects within this half mile radius. So SB 50 is, a, is one of the many bills that we need to track. And um, I would encourage this council and uh, our Tri-Valley Council members to attend the Ledge Action Day on the 24th. Going back to the whole CASA compact, and uh, the vice mayor and I attended mayor's conference last Thursday, where um, two council members, uh, Danville's Newell Arnerich and Concord's Laura Hoffmeister, and council member Geringer also attended, as well as council member Kendall. Sorry about that. Um, they were appointed to the CASA compact legislative task force, which is going to provide feedback on the various bills at Sacramento. In addition to that, the discussion at that meeting focused on what we believe is, is really wishful thinking on the part of many of the, these bills that high density housing would be built along transit and bus routes all throughout the Bay Area without much parking, and then everybody would get onto BART or Caltrain and go into the city or to Silicon Valley for their jobs. That's not going to happen. It's going to impact our highways. It's going to impact BART, which may not be capable of this increased ridership. And what many cities in uh, the surrounding counties, including Contra Costa, are advocating are bringing jobs to our areas so that BART can be used in both directions during the day so that there is a jobs housing balance throughout the Bay Area. And this particular graphic is quite striking. It came from the Casa Compact. This slide happens to be one that the Tri-Valley Cities put together. The blue uh, graph, the, the blue column is uh, uh, jobs, and the orange column is housing. And as you can see, the greatest job number of jobs are, are concentrated in three counties, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara. While Contra Costa does have a, an imbalance in jobs and housing, it is not as severe as the three counties. So the first thrust or series of recommendations that we will likely be making from the uh, public managers 
is that there be a focus on providing housing where the jobs are before the transportation infrastructure is burdened by building housing in the outlying cities. So I expect to bring that to you, whether the next meeting or the meeting after that. Um, I just wanted to provide you with an update to let you know that the public managers are working on this and we will be reporting back. Just one final thing that I mentioned in the staff report is that um, I did reach out to Townsend Public Affairs, which is a, a, lobby, uh, a lobbyist hired currently by the Tri-Valley Cities, by San Pablo and Walnut Creek, and they work hand in hand with those cities to influence legislation, to track legislation, to draft correspondence and letters for cities, and to really be nimble and stay on top of the legislation as it's moving through the committees. The proposal that was submitted to Lafayette was um, for $4,500 a month, for a, uh, uh, w which would cover all the tasks that I mentioned, and then some more. I have reached out to ask them whether they would consider a La Marinda uh, proposal. I have not heard back, and nor have we approached that concept formally with the other two cities. That ends my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. So we have questions for, yes, Vice Mayor Anderson. So it was, that's a very good report, and I think it's clear that um, it's gonna be difficult to change the direction. The emphasis on housing is kind of baked into everything that people are talking about, <coughs> whereas the jobs balance, the jobs housing balance is just not even on the table but that seems to be where we want to go. So that brings me back to Townsend. And I, I really would like to get that all before us as an action item. Okay. So we could take a look at that because in talking to folks at the dinner after the mayor's conference, it became clear to me that it's gonna be a matter of influence to get anything done with these bills. And Townsend clearly has the ability to get into Wiener's office, Chu's office, even Newsom's office. And that's what we were hearing from folks. They actually get calls back from the staff out of these different offices about their concerns on some of the bills. So I think if we're gonna have any kind of effect at all, that's gonna be what, what we have to do. So I'd love to see that on the table so we could take a hard look at that. Okay, thanks. Other questions for, or comments for staff? Yeah, sure, Mandel. thank you. Fantastic, um, please. I totally agree with Mike on that one. Let's just go as fast as we can with that group. Um, I have a, a question. Are, I keep seeing this job-rich housing project. Do we qualify in there or not? It's a very good question, and I don't have the answer, okay. and nor the, does the league at this time. It's not clearly defined in the right. bill, so we're trying to get answers to that question. Okay. I, I don't know at this point. Okay. Councilor Robles? Yeah, um, yeah just, a, just a couple of questions. Actually, just to pick up on that, I, I can discuss it with the staff as well. There has been um, the issue of what constitutes a jobs-rich community, as said, is right now not really well-defined in the current text of the bill. There has been some modeling that certain groups have done um, even some mapping that allow you to look by census tract at what would be considered jobs rich based on what is indicated in the bill. I could talk to staff about that, so that might be something that might be worth okay. sharing with council because it allows you to look in a very sort of spatially astute way at what those areas of the county and really the state would be. So that might be a useful tool for us to have access to as a sure. um, council. So um, I'll share that around with the staff and with the rest of the council. A um, couple just quick questions. There's a First of all, thank you for the excellent report, and I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, there's a part of the, the sharing the framework from the uh, Tri-Valley communities was really useful, um, the analysis and the framework they laid out. There was a part of, there was one part of it that I was really uh, intrigued by, um, and just wanted to sort of get your, your thoughts on it. Um, I'm just, I'll just read this part. It's on, I don't know the page number in front of me. But it's talking about the overall approach, and it says, um, uh, recent history has demonstrated that simply opposing legislation does not work and, in fact, may be counterproductive 
and that the Tri-Valley Cities will need to collaborate to influence legislative efforts, including proposing revisions to draft legislation to address new housing law as it is developed. And I think this goes to something Count Vice Mayor Anderson mentioned as well, which is our ability to actually stop SB 50 and other bills. SB 50, I think most people here know, passed out of committee, yeah. like 9-0 and 1, I think, last week. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's just one committee, obviously. But um, so I'm just, and I know that the positions that the Tri-Valley Consortium took, some of them were um, supporting certain pieces of it, like the ADUs and things like that. Others were opposed and less amended. So just any thoughts that you have on where the effort seems to be headed in terms of the balance between trying to stop some of these bills in their tracks and trying to at least improve them if they seem to be headed to the, to the governor's desk yeah. at some point? I think the best time to stop a bill is before it's drafted and introduced, and so it's pro probably too late for this year. Um, I, I don't think saying no to everything works because we're not heard, as, uh, our voice is not as effective, but to offer suggestions for amendment is a good thing. Mm. Um, the the Tri-Valley cities have focused on what is important to them, things that are important to them. We understand at the county level that we will not have consensus on all the items, so we may distill maybe half a dozen items that we can all rally behind, but then each city can prepare its own resolution with its unique comments and concerns. I do believe there are calls for action in the CASA Compact that are worth supporting. They deal with funding, and I think we can rally behind that. ADUs, as another example, is something that we can do, uh, we, we should get behind. I think we need to be very strategic and savvy about how we present our concerns to Sacramento, and having somebody like Townsend to guide us would be a good idea, because, uh, and I'll say one more thing, because I don't think saying no to everything has worked for us in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I did speak to um, Senator Glazer's office, and as you are aware, Senator Glazer is behind uh, our positions and is supportive and has advised us that what, if we truly need to amend bills, what we should all be doing is reaching out to uh, fellow council members and city managers and mayors from other ci cities where uh, their legislators serve on key committees and have them call their legislators because mm. us calling the leg uh, a different legislator is not as uh, effective as having a mayor of Larkspur call somebody, the legislator from that district. Mm. So there's a lot of work ahead and I think we need to, we need to come up with a plan of how we, when moving forward, we can be most effective quickly. And I realize this would come back to us if, we, if we're given the option to pursue a, an engagement with Townsend. This, would come, this detail would come back to us, I realize. But would Townsend's role be to actually potentially be crafting some of these amendments as part of that scope? Or? Yes. Okay. Uh, part of their proposal does involve advising cities on the types of amendments that might get approved. It also uh, includes drafting letters for cities with those suggested amendments. Okay. And I should have asked this up front. I apologize. Townsend, is that, there's a firm Townsend Usher. Is this the same lot? Is this, is this the John Townsend know. of that? Okay. It's called Townsend Pub, uh, Public Affairs. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Right. And they've had more of the. Councilmember Garinger. So I did, um, first of all, also kudos to all of the work that you've been doing and to the committee that's been um, working, <laughs> the mayor and others who've been working with you. And just in the last couple of days, all of the pieces around advocacy and helping to prompt us as to what we need to be doing, I really very much appreciate that and that you're moving in that direction. On the um, two things, I am supportive of getting the proposal from Townsend. I, and I know that as we look at the proposal, I'm also very uh, interested in knowing who their other clients are because uh, they have a lot of clients. And, and so 
they're working with uh, communities that are near us that have similar interests, but I think we also want to make sure that where we are and what sort of say we have in um, how they might be also representing other cities that um, may think that lots of these elements are great. And so conflicts around that, um, which also kind of brings me back to the League of California Cities. I think that that's one of the struggles that the League has sometimes is because of the diversity of the state and who they're representing. Um, sometimes we feel like we're not being heard and they're not pushing enough. So I think it is sort of a whole balance of Yes, maybe Townsend can help us with a few things and get us in, but that league partnership and building those coalitions. Um, so supportive of having Townsend come in, which also circles right back around to last year on AB 2923, while our goal was to, um, for lack of a better word, yeah, make it go away and never you know, see the light of day again. A lot of work went into building coalitions from throughout the state, and I'm looking at uh, Mayor Burks and others and, and our La Mirinda partners. So this work we're doing right now, while the bills are going through committees, the hope is some of them will die there, but um, we're gearing up, so we're not completely out of the water yet. And I mean, we're not completely behind the, what's the word I'm looking, um, behind the train and all of those things. We still have a lot of opportunities to partner there, and so um, excited that we want to move in this direction, want to be cautious on our, um, um, our use of which consultants we use, but I think we need all of the tools in our, our tool belt to make sure that we can um, fight these things without saying no and be strategic in our amendments. And so a big thank you to you, Naroop, for leading this effort. And it looks like you're having fun actually yes. doing it and learning it, so thank you. Okay, I've got, are there any other qu uh, comments for questions for staff? I, I've got several comments, but I'm gonna hold them. I do wanna thank our interim city manager's fantastic report, and she's done fantastic advocacy work above and beyond, I think, what, <laughs> you know, what, uh, what she's been asked to do in this space, because these are, these are critical issues for our town. You've heard me say it over and over again. This really, I mean, these next few years are gonna, are, I believe, will define the character of our, of our city for many, many years to come. But I'm gonna hold my comments until we get to some public comment, because I saw a few cards, and I'd like to hear what folks have to say. Oh, one card, okay. Is this Lynn? Lynn? Lynn Hedane? Okay, yeah. It's a year and a half of dizziness for oh. us discussion. And before you start, I would like to I would like to thank Ms. Hedane for her advocacy work. She's been yes. really just going after this in uh, the support support of the city around these bills. So thank you very much as a prelude to your comments. Thank you. 649 Los Palos Drive, Lynn Hedane. I wanted to toss a few comments into this. Um, with regard to the jobs housing balance, back in the days when we were fighting Shaping Our Future here, uh, which was another movement, a smart growth movement, had pretty much encompassed the county. Lafayette was found by, uh, I think it was Dan Smith of, of Hans Corvey and Chuck DeLue and Smith. Uh, that Lafayette had, was the only city in Contra Costa County that had a perfect jobs housing balance. And the meeting that took place over in the Contra Costa, of the Contra Costa Council, they deleted those words from the final draft. These people cheat, don't believe them. <laughs> uh, let me just put that in your head. Okay, then, um, if it, did any of you watch the housing hearing? at all in Sacramento? Did you watch that? Housing Committee? Live? Yeah. Maybe you noticed that the, the proponents were allowed to speak and give their comments and their name and where they came from, who they represented. The opponents were not. They were instructed by the, who, the fellow running the meeting, and I presume that was probably the vice chair of the Housing Committee, instructed the um, prop opponents that they were only allowed to give their name who they represented or where they lived and whether they were a yes or no. Some of them were able to squeak in a sentence, that was all. That is not fair and those rules need to be changed and that should not be allowed to be gotten away with. I was told by another comment, unrelated, uh, 
I was told by a BART board member that we should lean far more heavily on the League of California Cities to represent us and do a far stronger job of representing us. Uh, let's see what else, what else here. Uh, Oh, I think we should get ready to persuade Newsom not to sign those bills if they get past all their housing committees. Uh, I think 827, I believe, was stopped in the Finance and Transportation Commission, uh, up, or housing, a uh, committee, rather, up in Sacramento, so maybe we start working on them, too. Uh, it was interesting that I think it's 4, SB 4, at least eliminates high fire danger areas, which is something. Um, that's going to be before the same committee at the same time as SB 50. And uh, let's see here. Oh, I, in regard to defeating, I think, massive writing and massive calling. Am, can you hear me? Am I speaking loud enough? Okay. Massive writing, massive calling. Los Angeles would have stopped 29-23. They, it was, it almost halted. Uh, because they were so vastly opposed to it, apparently. At least that's what I heard. Um, but they were able to squeak through anyway, regardless. But it looked as if it was going to be stopped for a long time, apparently. And um, I think that is all. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any thank questions you. for the speaker? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else have comments on this? Might topic? try putting up. Cities might try putting up huge signs. Just like we used to do in campaigns, big ones that say no on SB 50. Drivers by see those things. They might think yeah. that's some um, massive opposition, and they might not be reelected. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, any other public comment before we bring it back to the council? Okay, we'll bring it back. There is a, a recommendation for this, but I, do we have comments? Any final comments? I know we kind of went through there. I looked on my side. So I, you know, I have a few comments. I, Sorry, a, lot, a lot of them have been um, echoed by my colleagues, but uh, I saw the Townsend proposal. I do believe we need a lobbyist. Uh, the League is, uh, it's a fantastic organization, but it's an education organization. They're, I don't believe they're, um, they're capable of handling what's happening with the political landscape right now, and the stakes are too high for our city. So we shouldn't put all of our eggs in one external basket. So maybe when we get to that part of the agenda, we can agendize bringing the Townsend proposal back. Um, so I do agree with that. I think, I think for the cost, it's something we should, we should consider. On SB 50, I mean, SB 50 is one of over 200 housing bills. And how many bills are actually have been submitted this year? 2,000 or so? Close to 2,000. I mean, the legislation in this state just stuns me. Um, a lot of it is a lot. A lot of it is good, and there'll be some good good laws passed that'll do good things for people that uh, in this state. But um, the, on the housing side, you know, we're um, we're facing down the, the gun barrel here pretty pretty sternly. And actually, one question I did have, and it was to the city manager, I forgot to ask: Have we heard anything from Southern California? Has the league talked about? what any counties or coalitions or anybody from Southern California, maybe even, even pockets of you know, urban areas of the, of the valley or the north? I have not heard of it. That doesn't mean that they haven't expressed it. You, have, you haven't heard anything? Yeah, okay. I have. Um, I would just echo the city manager's um, comments around building coalitions. And Senator Glazer's done a fantastic job in guiding us around that strategy. Um, it is about reaching out to other, in my opinion, other city councils and other mayors in different jurisdictions and targeting the ones that we know have assembly members and senators that wield influence in Sacramento and are going to be along the way in different committees and then on the floor if it reaches the floor. And I think that's something we can, we can perhaps all do individually, whether it's by picking up the phone or you don't have to hop on an airplane like I did, but you know, making short drives, sending emails, you know, just doing as much as we can for our part. But I think having Townsend to really guide us through is, is or, or another lobbyist or another group would be, would be really, really good. Um, I think we do, um, you know, at the end of the day, SB 50, I, in my opinion, the bill itself, I'm, I'm predicting will, will likely pass, hopefully with amendments that protect our city 
um, as much as it as much as it can. But but I think I think we really do need, with the help of our lobbyist or just through strategy, maybe between uh, Councilmember Bliss and I are on the legislative committee, bringing ideas to the council on potential amendments, and then really really going after those amendments, maybe the top three or five that would really protect our city the most, and then having all five of us kind of go after after those might be a strategy. This is all strategy, as our city manager talked about, but we've, we've got to formulate it now. We've, re we've really got to get on it, on it now. Um, we're working on our you know, first strategic goal is to maintain local control. That goal is, is going to be designed and delivered likely in the fall for the future. Um, this is for now. So it's something that I think that the council, in my opinion, I think we should spend a fair amount of time on, and I would like to, to see on quite a few agendas um, in the future. So I think um, a, lot of the, a lot of the notes that I finally was able to write on my new iPad here have been, uh, have been covered by my, by my, uh, by my colleagues. Um, I think um, one thing I would like to, to say on the CASA Compact, um, I, I do agree with the city manager that train has left the station. Um, you know, I think it's I, I think it's good to educate the public that you know it's 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 not worth the energy to fight the compact. It's it's worth looking at the bills that have incorporated elements that aren't good for our city, um, and go after those. And on the flip side, look for those elements that we think might be good for our city. I happen to believe that. Um, the element around ADUs is, is a positive thing. Um, there's several of the elements, most of them that I'm very, very worried about um, for Lafayette. But again, it's, it, it comes, down to, comes down to strategy and, and, and what we'll do. And I think uh, you know, within the next couple of months, I think we'll, we'll formulate that. Um, but with that, I think um, I really, really appreciate the city manager's energy around um, helping develop a countywide framework. And um, I would like to make a motion that we authorize the interim city manager to work with the Contra Costa County Public Managers Association to develop this response to the compact, at, compact and associated bills. Second. I'll make that motion. Second. We have a second. Okay, is there any conversation or additional thoughts? Okay, then I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. So we will move on to um, item 11A, and this is on repealing LMC chapter 5-5, and this is on our flavored tobacco products ban and licensing program, and I don't know if we have a staff report. There is no staff yeah. report. We're okay. asking for continuance to the so first I, meeting in May. Did you make the motion? Yeah, I move continuance to May 13th. And I'll second that motion. And do we have any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. All right, and we'll move on to 11B, and this is on 5G and the FCC's uh, order on 5G, and I think we will have a staff report. Hi, Kyle. Just give me a minute. I want to just set okay. up my mm -hmm. computer. around 2000. Two hundred houses, right? Around two hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
We're ready when you are. Thank you. Yeah, we're ready. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners, uh, commissioners, council members, and members of the public. Um, the item uh, before you this evening is um, an introduction to an ordinance of the city uh, council of the city of Lafayette, amending Title VI, Part Four, Chapter Six Fifteen of the Lafayette Municipal Code related to wireless communication facilities, Ordinance Number Six Seventy Three. And we're also seeking that the council approve urgency ordinance associated with the wireless telecommunication facilities and uh, design guidelines to allow 5G tower deployment in the public right of way. Um, before I get into the details of the ordinance and the design guidelines, I would like to invite um, Ms. Gail here from BBK, um, would, uh, she would go over some of the history of the wireless telecommunication and what uh, the FCC order entails the cities to do and the reason why we are here. Okay, thank you, welcome. Thank you, thank you and good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Gail Karish and I'm a partner at Best Best and Krieger. I'm actually based in the Los Angeles office and I just do telecommunications work uh, uh, for local governments. A lot of my time these days is, is being occupied by this topic. So this is, this is something that's happening on a national level, uh, the, this next round of deployments and a lot of efforts to um, preempt local authority over uh, traditional sort of land use uh, decision making uh, in this area. So uh, Payal, Payal is going to be my manager there of the PowerPoint, and I'm just going to I'm going to go through and try to do in about 10 minutes or so cover a, a very complicated topic in terms of the regulatory framework, but uh, hopefully just give you enough information on what's happening and what what federal and state laws are out there to give you the context for uh, the proposal for the ordinance amendments. So as I mentioned, the next, this is the, the we talk uh, about 5G or small cells, you hear a lot. This is uh, really just talking about a new types of wireless deployments that typically are smaller facilities than those big towers you're used to seeing when you're driving down the highway. And, and they uh, are deployed closer to users, so the, one of the target areas for these deployments by the wireless industry is in the public rights of way, uh, where other utilities typically are. Uh, so the, uh, I'll, in this presentation, I'll go through some of the different uh, the, uh, federal and state laws that impact local authority. Uh, the starting premise, of course, for any uh, city is that you have control over development within your city. You have police powers and you can control development. But of course, as you see in the prior uh, topic on housing, uh, very much like housing in telecommunications, there has been through the years uh, preemption both at the federal and at the state level. First, I'll go a little bit through the technology so that we're all kind of on the same page when we're talking about the, these issues. Uh, this is a, just a schematic of a typical wireless facility. You have, of course, antennas that are you know, transmitting uh, the radio frequencies. There's equipment uh, on the facility that is uh, kind of translating those wireless signals into something that can run over a, a wire. There's connecting cables. There's a support structure that's holding up everything. Uh, there's a power source, a, a, a battery or a meter and, and a power line coming in. And then there is a backhaul, what we call backhaul, and that is that uh, the most expensive part of a, of a wireless network is the wireless part. They auction off these licenses and so they want to get the, uh, the uh, signals Onto, uh, uh, onto fiber or something as quick as they, quickly as they can so they maximize the use of the wireless and they minimize you know, the, uh, the amount of license frequencies they need to purchase. So that's your typical facility. If you go to the next slide, you, we're really just talking about exactly the same, all those components, but in a smaller version. 
not necessarily the equipment always being smaller, but the coverage area being smaller. So that's what they're talking about when they say small cells. It just means it's covering a smaller area. And those come in two forms, basically. They're sort of like a standalone facility, and there's also what you hear sometimes distributed antenna systems. And that's where there are antennas on multiple, if you uh, go on the next slide, I think we have, oh, no. Uh, we'll, we'll come to one that we'll show you. Distributed antenna system, basically, you have multiple antennas that are all connected by fiber and are sort of operating together to cover an area. Uh, the, a common location, as I mentioned, for small cells is in the public rights of way on utility poles and street lights and things like that, and I'll have some examples as we go through. Uh, the wireless carriers are deploying these facilities to meet current demand, so they are putting in facilities that are 4G uh, facilities to increase capacity in high demand areas, to fill in gaps, things like that, but they also are looking to do this uh, for this, what we call 5G, which is the next uh, generation of wireless deployments. And if we turn to the next slide, so what is 5G? So 5G is like a marketing term, it's not particular spectrum, right? It, um, it's the next uh, generation of wireless technology. So this is just showing you the, the full kind of range of electromagnetic spectrum. Wireless is a very small part of it. There are a lot of other uh, uses, and of course, there are things like x-rays way off the charts over in ionizing, and uh, we're talking about uh, non-ionizing uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Next slide. And 5G is, as you can see here, is really going to, in this graphic, it's going to increase the capacity. So this is spectrum I like to describe as a really big pipe. So if you think of dial-up and then moving to broadband, this is like a big leap forward in terms of capacity, but the type of, uh, of uh, frequencies that they're planning to, to use, that they call millimeter wave, these don't have uh, the same kind of range. So that's why they'll have to be close to the users, close to the handsets, and uh, again, that's why uh, uh, there's a big focus on putting them in the public right-of-way. So here's some examples. On the left, that's when I actually took that picture in Oakland of a, a small cell that kind of looks like a macro site. I don't know if you can see very well, but there's actually some equipment in a little uh, uh, fenced off area on the ground, and those are pretty big antennas. Uh, the one on the, in the middle, that diagram shows you what I was talking about when there is a, a distributed antenna system. Uh, that the antennas are all connected and most of the equipment is off the public right-of-way. Uh, on the right is an example of a wireless facility on a, on a street light, uh, and you can see down where the sign is, they're quite closer to the ground, that's where they put some equipment, so it's sort of hidden behind a sign. Uh, on utility poles, there's sort of three flavors. It can be on the pole top, so usually it has to have an extra extension so it has a safety separation from the power lines. It can be what they call mid-pole, that's in the communication space below the electric electricity power lines, or it can be actually mid-strand, so an antenna attached to fiber that is uh, hanging on a pole. And uh, one, because of there is local regulation of design, there has been, and there still is a lot of evolution in terms of uh, stealth design. So you see some examples. The one on the left is actually a giant pole in um, Los Angeles. In the middle is in Palos Verdes Estates. They have an antenna that's attached uh, to a, a street sign. Uh, those there, and then there's some examples of uh, uh, more lamp posts, and the one on the right actually is uh, in Los Angeles, and it's one that has some 5G. There's almost no 5G equipment being deployed today because it's still being in the test phase, but they are testing in Los Angeles, and the 5G equipment on that pole are, are those little antennas that are below the lo top, pole top one, um, and that's... Uh, a 5G and 4G and 5G installation. Okay, so what's driving deployment in a word is 
cell phones and all of the, you know, it's all sort of started with the iPhone. And so all of these kind of connected devices, uh, the, as we go forward with other frequencies and more deployment, there will be other machine to machine kind of connected, internet of things, all of these sort of smart cities, all these things you hear that all uh, depends on a lot of wireless connectivity. So uh, it's not just we hear a lot about wireless carriers, but it's not only wireless carriers who, who are deploying wireless facilities. We have uh, telephone companies that uh, are like the carriers, carriers that are working for wireless facilities. They're putting in these systems. Cable operators are putting in Wi-Fi hotspots and also getting in the small cell market. Uh, gas, electric, water utilities are putting in smart meters and uh, data collection units that are in the public right of way. And uh, municipal, there are mun municipal uses for wireless as well, traffic and parking systems, public safety systems. There's a lot of demand. Okay, so now going through some of the federal law first. So uh, there are several provisions of federal law that have uh, mostly recognized local authority over planning, but but preempt some important aspects, and one uh, I'll talk about in a moment. But most of these laws that you see here were all passed uh, in the uh, 70s and the 90s. So the, it's only 47 U.S.C. 1455 that you see in the middle there. That was uh, adopted in 2012. Uh, and that requires certain types of changes to existing wireless facilities. If they meet certain criteria, have to be approved by local governments. But most of the laws that are on the books here uh, in this area have been around uh, since the 90s, since the beginning of the uh, wireless uh, deployments. So this is the most important one for planners, and they certainly know about this. It's put, put some limitations on local authority. Uh, you have to act within a reasonable time. You, have, uh, you can't uh, prohibit personal wireless services, that's cell phone services. If you're denying an application, it has to be in writing, writing supported by substantial evidence. You cannot consider RF emissions in your decision making. Uh, uh, because that is the purview of the FCC, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and you can't discriminate among uh, providers of functionally equivalent services. And that means you couldn't say, we don't want uh, small cells, we only want macro sites, or vice versa. And they, it uh, also allows for an expedited appeal process to, uh, to the court. The FCC, since 2009, has issued uh, several really important orders, and the small cell order, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is probably the most important, most, the most recent one from last year that is just going into effect, uh, has partly gone into effect already, and uh, the remainder on April 15th, and is the reason for the urgency ordinance in effect. Uh, but in 2009 is when they first started, uh, the FCC first adopted some shot clocks to hurry the procedures along at the local level. Uh, in 2014, they established a third shot clock for those, um, uh, those types of facility changes that, that local governments are required to approve under that 2012 statute that I mentioned. And then the two actions that they took in 2018, one is that they, they banned moratoria on processing applications. So you're not allowed as a local government to just say, we want to take a pause and think about this and come up with some rules. The FCC said that, you're, that is an effective prohibition of service. You can't do that. The second thing they did in 2018 is they adopted what I'm calling the small cell order, uh, and that was coming up with two more new shot clocks, even shorter ones, uh, specifically for small wireless facilities, uh, as they define it. And they also put some other limits on the fees that could be charged. They have to be cost-based, which mostly they are in California. Uh, but that also extended to uh, the fees for use of city property, such as streetlights, have to be cost-based. Uh, and they put some limits on the aesthetic rules that could be uh, applied in uh, evaluating 
uh, these applications. And the most important uh, rule there really is that the, the standards that you set have to be objective and they have to be published in advance. So those are the rules that are coming in on April 15th. The aesthetic portions, the shot clocks and fees have already gone into effect. And so the urgency here really relates to the need to have objective standards in place and a process that can actually uh, be completed in a timely way under these shorter shot clocks. I've talked about the moratoria ban that uh, doesn't allow you to push the pause button. So we can go to the next slide. And I've run through some of the, the things in the small cell order. Um, the um, other thing that I mentioned on the small cell order is that it only, it, it not only gives you a very short timeline, it, it also uh, says that all the authorizations that might be required from the local government, including any appeals, all of that has to happen within that timeline. So it's really um, quite an onerous um, process in terms of uh, a very short timeline for review. There is litigation uh, challenging the, both those FCC orders, the moratorium order and the small cell order, and uh, our uh, firm, I'm uh, part of the um, team that is uh, representing a large coalition who is appealing uh, these orders. Uh, there are other coalitions as well. All the local government parties are working very cooperatively in these appeals. They've all been consolidated in the Ninth Circuit, which we think is very positive uh, in terms of uh, uh, the circuits that we looked at and wanted to be in the Ninth Circuit. And there's a case management conference coming up in April 18th where we're trying, we're going to sort out, since this is large and complex litigation, sort out the briefing schedule. Uh, and uh, so we should know by the beginning of May, hopefully, uh, when, how long this appeal process will take. I said I would talk a little bit, a little bit about RF uh, uh, emission standards or exposures. I have a few slides. This is not my area of expertise entirely because I am not an engineer. But uh, I, uh, the FCC is the sole authority in the U.S. that can establish these standards. And, and so, as I mentioned earlier, local governments and, and even uh, state levels governments are completely preempted from acting in this area. What you can do is require that any applicant demonstrate that they are meeting the FCC standards. Uh, so next slide. Uh, the standards that have been uh, developed by the FCC, there are two categories. One is an occupational standard for per persons who are actually working in the industry and have to be near uh, wireless facilities. And the other is for the general population that they call sort of uncontrolled exposure. So you should be able to safely walk up and down your streets and know that you are not being exposed uh, to um, uh, RF emissions beyond the standards set by the FCC. This is just a sample slide showing that different types of Sometimes people are very focused on wireless facilities because you can see an antenna or a tower, but we're actually exposed to a lot of, um, uh, of um, electromagnetic uh, uh, emissions from other sources as well. This just has a few examples from a chart from the Electric Power Research Institute um, that was very involved in the deployment of smart meters, uh, which also raise some public concerns about RF emissions. And so this just shows that the levels uh, vary uh, quite significantly depending on what you're using and, and how far away you are from a particular source. So at the state level, I'm going to turn briefly to the state level, um, one of the key provisions at the state level is uh, a, a statute that was enacted uh, at the dawn of telephone companies deploying wireline facilities or telephone lines, and that is uh, Public Utility Code Section 7901. That grants a franchise to telephone companies uh, to use the public rights of way to place their facilities. And it's not an unfettered right. It has some limitations, and the limitation 
to use the language, is that it cannot incommode the public use. And that has been interpreted uh, in a, uh, and upheld in a very recent decision that actually just was issued uh, less than a week ago. Uh, the, that includes, that uh, evaluation of whether a facility incommodes the public use includes uh, an, the ability to consider the aesthetics of the installation. So that is uh, uh, important here when we're talking about wireless facilities because that telephone franchise grant has been interpreted to include uh, both uh, telephone lines, traditional telephone lines, and wireless facilities. So this is, this is a positive story at the state level, a recognition of local discretionary authority to consider aesthetics, uh, but we also have to live with the FCC orders that have put other limits on them. There are some other provisions of state law that are relevant to uh, wireless facility deployments. Uh, one uh, that was adopted, I think in 2015, that AB 57, it actually gives a deemed approved remedy if you miss, if a local government misses an FCC shot clock, but it only applies to the ones adopted in 2009. It doesn't apply to these current small cell uh, shot clocks that were just adopted in 2018. Uh, uh, there are some other provisions that have placed some other limits uh, on your uh, authority. And then I just have a note at the bottom. Um, it says 2018, but it should be 2017. Uh, there was an attempt, as you probably were aware, uh, to have a, a small cell bill passed in California, and it was actually vetoed by the governor. We were very involved, um, me personally, very involved in that uh, we have a, uh, our firm has a lobbyist um, as part of our group of government uh, relations lobbyists in, in um, Sacramento and we had a small coalition that worked with the league and with some others um, on, uh, on opposing that legislation and managed to get a veto out of the governor, which I, in, in hindsight was one of the big reasons why I think the FCC acted after with this small cell order because California is a very attractive market for the wireless, uh, wireless providers, but here we are. Uh, so at the state level, not much of a role. It's mostly federal and, um, and local because federal preemption, federal regulation of spectrum, local regulation of aesthetics. But the California Public Utilities Commission does play a really important role in regulating one of the most important um, structures that is available for small cells in the public right-of-way, and that is utility poles. They're, they have extensive regulation of utility infrastructure, including the safety of utility poles. Um, there is another organization called the North, Northern California Joint Pole Association. There's North version and a Southern California version. That's an, a, an association of pole owners. So a utility pole can be owned by multiple parties and that's the uh, organization of utilities that sort of manages the ownership of poles. So if a, uh, a wireless provider wants to use space on a pole, they'll have to comply with CPUC orders for what's a safe installation. They will also have to Either if they're a member of one of these associations, they could buy space on the pole through the association, or if they are a renter, you can buy or you can rent space on a pole. If they're a renter, they would uh, uh, enter into a pole attachment agreement and uh, rent space on the utility pole. And when we're talking about city-owned streetlights, uh, we, we employ the same sort of concept of if you want to rent space on the street light, then we have an agreement that is like a license agreement, much like a pole attachment agreement. So the, 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 this is just a list of some of the key orders of the CPUC uh, uh, that deal with the safety of uh, installations of telephone and electric lines. And um, GEO 159A, is a, an order, a general order that defers to local zoning for cellular facilities. And it was adopted 
uh, when uh, wireless facilities were only really being deployed uh, on a macro kind of level, the big towers. But the court in this recent decision from just last week actually mentioned General Order 159A as further support for why local governments have not been preempted by anyone in, in terms of regulating aesthetics. So that's the end of my presentation. In summary, the next generation of wireless facilities we're expecting will be largely in the public rights of way. Um, they, there is a right to use the public right of way, but the local governments have aesthetic uh, control. Uh, federal law and FCC orders have placed a lot of limitations on your authority in terms of the time for action and some limits on the aesthetic uh, regulations that you can develop. Uh, the CPUC is mainly responsible for the safety of the utility poles. They're not really regulating otherwise in this area. And uh, uh, local governments regulate placement and aesthetics. Uh, you have to comply with shot clocks, and uh, the shot clocks just keep getting shorter. So that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gail. I just wanted to add sure. a little bit uh, and just go over the structure of the guidelines as we have put together. Uh, basically, as Gail mentioned, we have till April 15 to come up with uh, design standards that are objective that will allow these facilities in the public right of way. So the way the guidelines are structured, uh, we are taking a very kind of restrictive view vis-a-vis uh, -vis the deployment of these facilities in the public right of way for the downtown, uh, specifically the downtown specific plan area, where we are saying that the, these facilities will only be allowed on utility poles and on traffic poles, and not on any decorative light standards or other light standards. Furthermore, we also restrict replacement of um, light standards for light standards with facilities in the downtown area. In other places in the city, we do allow the um, facilities to exist on light standards, on uh, traffic signal lights, as well as on utility poles. And the guidelines are structured with um, kind of an overview of standards that apply to all facilities everywhere, and then particularly goes down into detail where there's existing facility and people want to attach wireless telecommunication facilities do that, um, specific standards for poles, utility poles, specific standards for replacement poles, and new poles. So there are kind of the four categories. Okay. Um, and i um, happy to answer any questions. Okay, well thank you both very much. And we appreciate you coming to visit us from <laughs> Southern California to provide such a, a comprehensive orientation, which I found very interesting, so thank you. I, I'm sure we will have some questions for you both and a great staff report as well, Pyle. So I'll look to my colleagues for questions of the, for the staff, Vice Mayor Anderson. Thank you for the presentation, I appreciate it. It answered a few questions like, uh, <clears throat> what is the strand-mounted facility? I <laughs> had no idea, so now I know. No. We're not gonna allow that. I, I guess I wanna kinda deal with the, the real question that I think a lot of people are concerned about is, what real authority we have. And I just want to kind of state it again. What, what I hear you saying is we don't really have any authority over the placement of these items other than their appearance. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I would say you also can be concerned about uh, safety issues like ADA compliance, things like that, that are your traditional sort of right-of-way concerns, okay, right? But, Visibility, but things like that. We cannot be concerned about the RF, the frequencies that they're generating and potential health hazards that come about because of those frequencies. That's correct. That That's totally only the purview of the federal government. That's off limits for us. That's off limits. Can't consider that in our considering where these are going to be located. Right. You can you can consider you can ask uh, and uh, you can ask a a applicant to demonstrate that their facility will comply. They typically do a report on where the 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 uh, facility is going to be located that it will meet those standards. Uh, but that's that you can't deny applications or otherwise regulate based on a concern about RF emissions. Okay, and I did read that there is litigation going on. You mentioned it also. 
if we go ahead with what we have as the ordinance, the, the urgency ordinance and urgency resolution we have tonight, does that put us in a position where we can't pivot if the litigation is successful and we gain more authority? Do you follow my? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, the way you would address that would be the same way you're addressing the order now. So you're adopting uh, uh, changes or you're being, what's being proposed for you to do is to adopt changes to your ordinance to bring you into compliance with what the order requires. You could, if the order is overturned, um, usually it would be remanded, so you might get a new FCC order out or something like that, then you could uh, um, make further amendments to address uh, different changes in your authority. Okay, so the urgency ordinance and resolution doesn't commit us to anything that we can't change right. should the litigation be successful in some form. That's correct. Okay, and then I was kind of just wondering how <coughs> far apart are these going to be located? Right. I mean, you said they don't transmit very, how, how far is it a block or every half a block or what? So there, it, so it, uh, it, I'm going to give you kind of an unsatisfactory answer. I'll uh, take they, it. It, it depends a little bit on what is being deployed, right? So there are different types of facilities going in. The 4G facilities, uh, the, the small cells that are just filling in capacity, they usually only cover maybe 500 feet. 500 so. feet. Yeah or a thousand feet, depending on, you know, how tall they are and what the foliage is around and, you know, what sort of the target. Uh, there, we don't know with the 5G facilities or the millimeter wave facilities where we'll end up, but the, so, sometimes carriers say as, as, as little as like every 200 feet you might have a facility. Yeah. That's yeah. bizarre. I, I like to add to that, um, as part of the application process, we will be requiring uh, providers to provide a map uh, showing that they really need the capacity and they really need that facility at that particular location. So it is not kind of a given, they have to demonstrate the need. However, once they have done that, we cannot deny the application. I understand, but what I'm understanding from what you're saying is that a network of 5G may have to be 200 to 400 feet on center. Yeah, yeah, and if you think about what uh, their, the, some of the uses are for this network or what are the, some of the capabilities, it, when you talk, when you hear people talking about connected cars, automated vehicles, imagine the, how robust a network you need to be able to actually operate something like that, that is in real time, not having a bunch of cars crash into each other kind of thing, right? So there, the, uh, the level of uh, the quality of the networks, it just won't be acceptable. Like if you're on your phone and you drop a call and right. you just call right. back, right. you can't really have that you can't with do that traffic. in the car, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, well that's what I had now. I have some questions about the resolution and the ordinance when we get to that, but uh, that helps me understand where we are. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Councilmember yeah. Kandel. Uh, hi, I'm Susan Kendall. Um, I've, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, were you involved in, so these other cities that have adopted ordinances that have basically said no, we're not, they may not be part of the actions against the FCC, but they've written their own ordinances. And I, quite, I sent this off to Mala earlier today. Um, did you help write those ordinances as part of the BBK effort? So I, you'd have to, okay, I've so worked with a okay, lot of Section cities, two, all right. So the city council hereby finds that adoption of this ordinance will enact only minor changes in land use regulations, and it can be seen with certainty that its adoption will not have a significant effect on the environment because it will not allow for the development of any new or expanded wireless telecommunication facilities anywhere other than where they were previously allowed under existing federal, state, and local regulations. So they basically said no. Um, That's very different than the ordinance that we're looking at right now. And I was just wondering if you were involved with that or if your I, firm was involved with that. Okay. So I, ha I would have to know the city, but I... I um, uh, Mill Valley, Fairfax. 
So Mill Valley, it, I do not do work for, right. for Mill Valley. I, I do, uh, we, our firm does represent Fairfax. I think uh, in that case, I have actually been working with the town on, I've been to several planning commission meetings and city council meetings on an update to their, uh, the sort of a replacement for their urgency ordinance. That was uh, uh, adopted before I was asked to uh, participate in any of the drafting or anything like that. But what, what you uh, read there sounded like a, a, a CEQA determination. It was part, yes, it's part, yeah. it's before, and then it goes into the CEQA, yes. Yeah, that sounds like a. But it's very different than our ordinance. Well, that's just a CEQA determination. Uh, that, that doesn't, so what it says may not necessarily, I mean, it's hard to, to speak sort of in a vacuum, uh, yeah. but um, that, that's just a statement of what their belief is of what they're doing with this ordinance. Um, and so whether it fully does that, I'd have to evaluate the entire ordinance and say, because they didn't, none of those cities, as much as I'm familiar with what's been adopted, and, and this is mostly in Marin County mm -hmm. cities that have been doing this, uh, they didn't, you know, just simply issue a ban. So they did adopt pretty extensive ordinances that, that on their face uh, have, they're, they're not outright banning uh, wireless facilities in the entire city. No, but they went, they went in that direction, mm -hmm. right? Much more than, than what we are going to do. That's uh, how I was reading. But it sounds like you're not the right person to be asking for anyway. <laughs> It'd be nice to... Well, I can't. I haven't done that evaluation, so right. I don't want to. No, I totally it's fine. Yeah. I totally get that. Yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So, I'll go on to another one. Um, so, are you also representing the cities that are bringing um, the action against the FCC? Yeah, uh, our, our firm represents the largest uh, coalition of cities that have fought, or cities and counties and national associations that have filed again, uh, an appeal of the, both those orders, the moratorium order and the small cell order, yeah. And in those, did you help draft any of the ordinances that their city adopted at this state in order to, like, like we're adopting tonight, that were Oh, of towards, coalition members? Yeah. Yes, yes, I've been working with uh, a lot of cities on updates to their wireless ordinances. So what, they're, what most cities are doing are, pretty similar to, you know, there's, there's degrees in there, but the pretty similar to what is being proposed here, and that is uh, taking steps to, to make sure that they can at least process applications in a timely way um, and uh, a, a adopt some standards for aesthetics that are objective and published in advance, and, you know, sort of trying to meet the spirit of what the FCC is requiring, but that doesn't, doesn't prevent them from uh, participating in the appeal of the order. It's just the order is in effect. Yeah. Uh, the shot clocks went into effect in January. The aesthetic, the standards, the kind of limitations on aesthetic standards go in effect on April 15th. That is the law. Um, as a, and um, we asked twice, we asked the FCC and we asked the 10th Circuit before everything got moved to the 9th Circuit. We asked for a stay of the effectiveness of the order and we were denied both times. Uh, and so the reality on the ground is uh, to choose, uh, you know, sort of choose your battles. And so that's how most cities have, that I've been working with have come out on it. Thank you. And I do appreciate all the work you've done and same with Payel too. <laughs> um, so I, I did go to the city of Arenda's meeting on this and they had somebody come in. And the way that I, I was hearing it is that each carrier, and of, of which we have four, I guess, major carriers, and possibly five, each of them will be setting up their own 5G network. And so there'll be multiple carriers maybe on the same pole. Um, their estimate for Arinda, which is a smaller city than ours, was 820 of these cells. And so they're just literally everywhere. And so I imagine ours will be 1,000 plus, right? And so that, that would be a swag or more, right? Yeah. 
And so they're, they're basically everywhere. Do you agree with that kind of number? Is that the, so how this is? A, any number right now is kind of speculation. There right. is, uh, there are four major carriers. Two of them are trying to merge, so that would be three. Mm -hmm. uh, they are allowed under FCC rules and federal law to build their own networks. They don't have to share networks. So that that is true, They, they and they are very competitive. Uh, so we do expect to see at least three networks out there, but how many and how fast will, I, mean, I think the business models for actually, you know, monetizing this deployment is gonna take a while to sort out. And so what we actually see in deployment at the end of the day and where um, is, is not clear today. Okay. Um. Uh, I heard that private roads are exempt. That was what was said in Arenda. So any private road in Lafayette would be exempt. So How do you read that? Private roads are not subject to Public Utility Code Section 7901. So it's not a public right-of-way. Right. But they are not exempt from the FCC order. Uh, the FCC order uh, applies to... Um, the FCC order apply on, on in terms of the city's regulatory capacity. It applies. It, it doesn't distinguish the location. We just know, we, and we, we dealt with in the emergency ordinance, uh, public rights away because we know that is where most of these wireless facilities are going to be deployed. Public uh, private streets, uh, whether a utility could could use the private street will depend a little bit on like what kind of an easement they have and things like that that may may take them out of uh, being available for use, but not because the FCC order wouldn't apply, more of a, a property rights issue. So Pyle, how do you guys see how that playing out in Lafayette, like of our private streets? Do they all have, um, uh, I think we were just saying that if the owners of the private street want to permit it, or if there's already an existing utility easement, then they would be able to go in. But it would be easier for them to deny it. That's the flip side, right? If they don't want correct. it, you think that if that would be no true there's no easement and they don't want it, correct. Okay. Right. All right. All right. Good. Um, what I was mentioning was in terms of the, the city's regulatory authority, like permitting sort of authority, uh, the FCC order didn't distinguish, and the 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 that's a difference between in some states where you saw small cell bills passed, they uh, only applied in the public right of way in some instances. So it was a little bit more uh, narrow. Okay, um, so uh, you you listed a whole bunch of um, other entities that were deploying these. Um, what? control do we as cities or I mean, what, what control do we have over those or those totally outside of Lafayette's control? So some of it depends on the, so the, uh, if we look at the, the list here, the wireless carriers and the telephone companies, that's mostly what we're talking about in terms of deploying here because they're the ones that are supporting the wireless, wireless, um, you know, cell phone networks. Uh, the cable operators, they um, are in California, would be uh, subject to the same sort of limitations uh, right now as, as uh, the wireless and the telephone companies. So they would, their, and their facilities would be captured uh, by this if they're deploying uh, facilities uh, for, the, for uh, that purpose. The gas electric water utilities, I, I know the gas and electric, uh, have, um, they have a different type of franchise under state law. Uh, they've, and they have already deployed uh, their advanced metering infrastructure. It doesn't have to be as, uh, as frequent because they cover broad areas just to read the meter periodically. Um, and those, um, there is a, a, a CPUC general order that, uh, 
uh, requires that they work with local governments, but it's not really entirely clear if a local government could just absolutely say no to them or not. It's a, a it's more of a vague area of the law. But they're not into this. Uh, they're They've done sort of the deployments they want. It's more limited uh, to the advanced metering infrastructure. They haven't, they haven't done, uh, gotten into the wireless market, so they're not really supporting the wireless providers. And then the municipal uses, uh, you wouldn't, uh, there would be no limitation. It would be your using your own rights of way and your own facilities by and large. So would, uh, would this ordinance, if they did choose to some, for some reason go into this, our, our ordinance would still cover them right. too? Right. Okay. That's, I just kind of want to make sure that we were covered there. Um, so, and then come down to my last question, which is the one that I really have a hard time with, is the um, safety standards. And, and why I agree with you, but I don't agree with you, is that um, in terms of being able to touch the FCC safety, is that in their tables, they have empty cells in their tables for the maximum uh, magnetic field and uh, electric field for 5G. They are not populated. And, that, and we refer to them in this ordinance. And I was wondering what, I know you said I was asking. So basically, they right. we refer to 47 CFR section 1.1307B and that one goes to the FCC adop adopted limits um, in 1.1310, and there's that table where for 5G, it's, it's empty. And I, I don't know how our city, and so, I don't know if you guys, there's, there's these tables that they, and, and there's empty, empty tables where the 5G maximum exposure for, uh, electric field strength and magnetic field strength. My problem is that here we do want to enforce it. We want them to measure, right? You know, we want to have them going out there, and especially if they've got multiple carriers, they've got the three different carriers, they're all aiming, these 5Gs aim and they pulse. We want them to test that, but the FCC itself has not adopted the actual limits for these. Has any, are any of these FCC actions addressing this? Because I see that as a huge, Gap. So, uh, as I understand it, so, so what you're referring to is a table that has, th uh, I think it has three columns with figures, and, and two of the columns don't have a number, but there is a number uh, in one of the columns. No. For 5G. Okay, so the electric field and magnetic field strengths for the frequencies of 300 me uh, megahertz up to 100,000 megahertz, um, which covers the 5G range. Those yeah. are empty. They do have a power density and yeah. an average time. Right. So but there the are numbers there, and and the FCC there are num they're not in every column, but they're in the columns that the FCC determined were relevant for that uh, level of spectrum. And there's a, um, and we can share this with you uh, later. We wanted to get this to you sooner, I think, but. Um, there is a, a local, what's called a local government official's guide to transmitting antenna RF emission safety rules that explains a lot of these things. Right. And one of the, with respect to the electric field strength, magnetic field strength, and power density, in the guide, it states that the electric field strength and magnetic field strength are used to measure near field exposure and at, at frequencies below 300 megahertz. So the, those ones are empty because they're not relevant for the, the type of um, um, uh, megahertz uh, exposure being um, um, being but these, but being these are 5G. To. Like they don't. No, they what, don't what I'm saying is, I'm reading what the the FCC uh, guidance right. says on that. I'm I'm not an RF engineer, so I, I can only explain it so well. But uh, what the what the FCC is saying in their in their report when they developed those standards is that those those uh, for over 300 megahertz, those two columns, they don't have numbers because those numbers are not relevant for the, that type of um, uh, megahertz spectrum. It, they are. I am an engineer. <laughs> well, I'm telling you what say, the FCC says. I'm not, right. I, I, and maybe I'm not phrasing it 
properly to say yeah. not relevant, but what maybe I should just read the paragraph that I'm referring to that might be more helpful. So it says electric field strength and magnetic field strength are used to measure near field exposure. At frequencies below 300 megahertz, these are typically the more relevant measures of exposure and power density values are given primarily for reference purposes. However, evaluation of far field equivalent power density exposure may still be appropriate for evaluating exposure in some such cases. For frequencies above 300 megahertz, and that's what we're talking about with 5G, above 300 megahertz, only one field component need to be evaluated and exposure is usually more easily characterized in terms of power density. Transmitters and antennas that operate at 300 megahertz or lower include radio broadcast stations, some television broadcast stations, and certain personal wireless services facilities. Most personal wireless service facilities, including all cellular and PCS, as well as some television broadcast stations, operate at frequencies above 300 megahertz. So what their report is that those uh, numbers are not uh, the ones that that are, they use for measuring when it's above 300 megahertz. Uh, I, I, that, but it, I can, I yeah. can't, I, well, I'm all I can do is the, tell you what it, it says and, and that the FCC's position is that they do have standards that cover 5G. And I know that there is, uh, the FCC started in 2013 a proceeding to update its standards with respect to exposures from handsets and it has not completed that um, it has not completed that proceeding, and that is one of the issues that we have raised right. uh, in, in the appeal because we understand, I, I go to a lot of city council meetings and planning commission meetings, I understand that there is a lot of public concern. I'm not the rule maker, I'm just the delivery of, you know, the one who has to deliver the message that the FCC takes the position. They have covered this area, and, um, and uh, so that is where where you know they don't see uh, a space for local governments uh, setting their own regulation. Right, I, I understand what you're you're saying, and I totally appreciate um, you reading. But you understand that the, the typically and the the wording in there is so not relevant to somebody going out there and testing. You know, it doesn't, it's so vague and it doesn't really describe the situation at all. And the fact that they haven't even done the wireless ones, which are even a lower, you know, range, it just, the FCC has not captured this yet. And, and the safety studies have not really been done. Otherwise, they'd be quoting them. And I, and I just was hoping that you were reading something different that I've been reading, but you haven't. No. <laughs> it's all the same it, stuff. It's very frustrating. I cannot <laughs> tell is. you how frustrating it is at a local level because it, it's city councils and planning commissions that hear from the public, hear the concern, and they're powerless to, to adopt the rules. So so they we just keep trying to get that message through to the FCC. And there is some effort uh, in Congress as well, I think, to get this message because to get this message to the FCC to get them to do something to update their studies because it, it is obviously an issue of public concern. There's no doubt about it. Um, I know Planning Commission, you said that there was, they were gonna try to do some measure, they had some provisions they were talking about but didn't get into your report. Did the Planning Commission come up with anything different than what was, that you put in? Okay, so it was, uh, huh. Pursuant to Planning Commission's recommendations, uh, except the last bullet point, because per federal law, local jurisdictions are not allowed to require installation of meters on the wireless facilities that would allow constant monitoring of the radio frequency being emitted by the equipment. At the time of preparation of this staff report, draft minutes of the Planning Commission meeting were not available. What did they say? So um, during the Planning Commission review, they had mentioned that uh, one of the commissioners had seen a poll where there was a meter that was showing exactly what the emissions were right. uh, at any given time, and that she was wanting for us to include in our standards that such meters be installed. Mm -hmm. And I conferred with the expert and uh, was told that actually under the FCC order, we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> we're not allowed to measure. We're not allowed to constantly monitor. 
were not allowed to constantly monitor. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't require them to have a meter that is constantly showing what the frequency it's emitting. So our city couldn't even put in a constant measuring no, the city device. Could. It, it, it's, the city could do your own measures. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, There is a case, there's one California case, and I'm trying to remember the name of the city. Is it Glendale, I think? Um, no, the city of Calabasas. Where, where uh, they attempted, they adopted an ordinance. This is n nothing to do with small cells, but a, a few years ago, ad adopted an ordinance uh, and had a very um, had all kinds of things that had that had to be done uh, by a carrier to uh, demonstrate constant compliance with RF emissions standards. And they were sued, and they were uh, the carrier was successful in the lawsuit and saying that they had, um, that the FCC setting the standards preempts local governments from establishing like their own compliance program. So you, you can't force a carrier to put on meters that are measuring things and all things like that. You can as a matter of your own code enforcement and, and, and you know, make ensuring that, um, the conditions of approval are met. You could you could hire inspectors to go out and do these sorts of things. You just can't put that onus of in, uh, on the uh, carrier themselves. Okay, thank you. May I ask a question? Yes, I was just going to ask. Sorry, sorry. yeah, I'm and, done. And sorry. A, uh, no, good questions. Got oh yeah, I waited younger. until I heard her yeah. say I am done. So as <laughs> a follow-on, I guess. So. Um, so hearing that we can't require the, the carrier to pay for the monitoring, um, we do have within our ordinances that they will have to, or actually the FCC says they have to meet the FCC standards. And then we have in our um, ordinances now and in the one that, that we're looking at, um, reporting back and finding ways to test and I know there's a question whether every three years is enough or every but if we independently had the uh, cell sites tested and we determined that they were um, not within the FCC standards what's our recourse what's our enforcement well, possibilities there. I, one thing, and this is this does happen from time to time. There was um, um, usually what you would do is report to the Federal Communications Commission to um, investigate whether there is compliance, and that actually happened a few years ago with roof, rooftop facilities that Verizon Wireless had. Uh, there were uh, a number of inspections there found that they hadn't put up proper Kind of um, when it, when you're dealing with a rooftop facility, there are certain areas of the rooftop that you shouldn't have people going walking through and things like that, and they hadn't adequately marked them and things like that, and they were actually uh, um, fined by the FCC and they had to enter into a compliance order. So it would be that kind of reporting. Um, obviously, you would go to the carrier right away and ask them to you know confirm the results, things like that, and if they were in violation of the uh, their conditions of approval, then it would be the kind of uh, thing that might be subject to a revocation hearing or something like that. Okay, and so can we, um, let's see, to the, so we can't make the standards hard or more stringent because they're the FCC standards and right. those are the ones the carriers have to comply with. Can we um, have them have shorter time frames on monitoring and reporting back, or are those set as well? Those, oh, did you, uh, those are set in your ordinance now at yes. three years, I think, every three years. And I remember I was actually, um, uh, the last time I was here was a planning commission hearing when, I think when they were adopting uh, those provisions. And I know that was something at the time that the carriers complained about that said that it was unlawful. I, think um, I don't uh, know if we've had, if you've had any uh, enforcement on that or if they've been complying since. They have been complying yeah, since they to have my been. knowledge, yeah. I'm but sorry, you were, uh, you, were th you, were, you were thinking of making that less than three years, like Yeah, three like years if we wanted to have tests every. Annually? Yeah, I'm just 
So I think what I remember reading the part about how they pushed back on that before. Right. I was just trying to get us to a place of um, comfort with that those standards in the first year yeah. when we they're installing them. We know they meet them. Um, then in three years, if three years has been working, but we don't really know, you know, the three five years G have yet. been working. We can certainly do it. Uh, do a more restrictive standard and. If we get pushback from the providers or the people who deploy, deploy this, we might have to come back and revisit that. So that is certainly something that we can do today, but okay. we might get challenged. Uh, and that goes uh, true with the development standards as well. Okay, that was it for now. Councilman Bliss. Yeah, I, I had two questions. First of all, thanks, thank you both for the excellent presentations and um, for helping us address these questions. Um, like my colleagues on council, you know, I'm troubled by um, the steps the FCC has taken in the last year or so and the extent to which this really limits in some pretty severe ways local control. And so like others up here, I'm kind of trying with, um, with your guidance to think about what are the levers, limited though they might be, that we might have available to us um, in light of some of these changes. So I have two questions that I guess relate to that. One actually ties back to the question from Council Member Kandel about um, when these sort of um, deployments occur on private land, like private streets outside of the public right of way, and what, um, what options we have there. I know in the development standards, it makes reference to, um, for things outside of the public right of way, um, preferred and discouraged sites. Um, what, in this context for small cell deployments, what does that mean? I mean, if we stipulate something as being a um, discouraged site, I know it wouldn't apply to public right of way. Does that then, when we actually have a project before us under this ordinance that we have to um, review, does that then carry the force of allowing us to make findings that because it runs counter to our stipulated preferred sites, we can basically deny a, a request to put something a deployment on uh, private land or on a pri uh, private street in this case. Correct. So the zoning administrator would have the authority to make those uh, determinations uh, with respect to the small cell sites. Uh, and there is a very quick turnaround uh, for an appeal process within the shot clock period. So, but you're absolutely correct. There would be the capacity to say this is not our preferred site. You have not demonstrated that you can only deploy this facility here and not somewhere else to get the coverage and the capacity that you need. And for these reasons, we are denying your application. Mm -hmm. So we certainly have that authority. Okay. My other question goes to the scope of our review in terms of aesthetics of the small cell deployments, which I understand is something that is within mm -hmm. our purview. Um, and I know that the thinking, as I think of, as I understand that from reading the ordinance, the idea of aesthetics has to do with the aesthetics of a particular placement of a small cell, which I assume has to do with visibility, color, how well it fits into the surrounding environment. Um, but is there any way, given the density that might be at work with some of the, you know, if you think about a carrier deploying a series of small cells across the community, given that there's this trade-off between faster bandwidth and shorter range, do we have any ability as a council to think of the deployment of like a series of cells, like the density of cells within our community as being something that would fit under the category of aesthetics? Or is that not something that we would have the ability to, to weigh in on? So the, the FCC order covers this idea a little bit. You're, to put it another way, you're kind of thinking of the spacing of facilities, like how can you have a spacing requirements? Some communities try to to make sure you know you don't have this on every single utility pole or something like right. that. Right. Yeah, I'm sort of yeah. Yeah, exactly. right. right. It's kind of the clutter. Right. Uh, so th it's a little bit of a fine line. The FCC talks about this. They they you know can't write an order under 100 pages, but they only talked about spacing requirements in a paragraph. And and all they said is it's sort of like the other aesthetic requirements. Um, they have to be um, reasonable. It has to be uh, objective, uh, published in advance, and uh, it might be okay 
they basically said it might be okay or it might not. It's going to depend. So that's their sort of subjective view of how you're supposed to go. Sure. So a, lo a little bit of this is going to be sort of trial and error. Um, at the state level, there is the case law that supports your being able to um, regulate aesthetics in the public right-of-way. They, 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 they deal with this a little bit more concretely in the sense that you, um, you, you, can't, you can try to deal with the, the clutter sort of aspect of deployments or more lines, but it, your, your decisions always have to be uh, reasonable and based on substan sub substantial evidence, right? So you, you can't, where, where you get caught up is if there's already an area that has a lot of clutter, it's hard to say no more because we're opposed to clutter. Uh, and uh, it, areas that are more pristine, it's, it's going to be a little bit easier, which seems unfair in a sense. But okay. it's, it's a very difficult issue because aesthetics are inherently sort of subjective right. and sort of thinking of the future. And the FCC is trying to impose on local governments something that what the carriers have asked for is that they can basically read your standards and have a good sense of to know what they can apply for that would be approved so oh, that, that's really helpful so but we so as i hear you say that we could in theory set objective by which i mean quantitative numerical standards for the density of deployment of these smaller cells as long as they're clear and transparent for carriers without necessarily running afoul of the federal law. Right, but then if a carrier comes back and say that doesn't work for our technology and we need to be here or something, then that would be the pushback, yeah. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, so the, a couple questions, then we'll go to public comment, because I know a lot of you wanna, wanna speak, and I'll, then I've got some comments afterwards, but on the objective standards part and the urgency ordinance, that is due by, in by April 15th, correct? So if, so if we wanted to enhance what the Planning Commission has suggested or make any amendments, we'd have to call for a special meeting? Yes. Right. Or what, what would well, be the we process? Have to, uh, we, we could adopt it tonight, and we could make changes right now, and then adopt it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and then just one or a couple questions for our visiting BBK uh, lawyer. You've, so you've heard the concerns of my, my colleagues here. You've read our draft ordinance. You've read our draft urgency ordinance and resolution. Is there anything that we could, are there any changes um, in your opinion that we could make that would conform or satisfy some of our concerns that you can think of? The, well, um, <laughs> I know it's I know it's a big question, but I mean, are we? Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll phrase it this way: Are we compared to all the cities that you work with? Um, does our ordinance does our ordinance look and feel the same? Have we given it enough scrutiny? Have we taken advantage of everything that 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 we, that we that we can under under a local control premise? In your opinion. So I think I think that e I would I would split it sort of in two categories on the procedural side. Everyone is sort of in the same boat. You have to find a way to evaluate these applications and in, in these sort of unreasonably ridiculously short timelines. And so everyone's moved to that sort of procedural, trying to do it administratively, simplify it as much as possible. On, on the aesthetic standard sort of side, I think that's where there's, I see a lot more variation. I can't say what, you know, what every city sort of has their own take, areas they want to protect, uh, their particular concerns. So this, your, your package doesn't seem all that different um, it, outside the norm of the variability. Uh, one, one, uh, advantage I think with the um, what the process where and we're doing this in a lot of cities where they adopt the standards by resolution is it gives you it's easier to change it gives you more time to come back and make uh, changes one thing that we uh, haven't heard from too much in this community is is from uh, the carriers themselves and in some communities we have a lot more feedback from from the carriers so you may get that in you know, in coming weeks or something. 
Um, so uh, there, if, if, you, uh, if you can tell me what you think you want to do, I, I think there are things, if you talked about spacing requirements or shortening up the, um, you know, how often you get reports on RF emissions, I think those are things that you can certainly try out and you'll see with t over time, you know, how the reactions are. Like we, we, you know, back several years ago when we put in the every three year uh, compliance requirement, there was a lot of pushback from the carriers, but I'm hearing now that they, they are complying, so. Okay. Okay, thank you, that answers my question. I appreciate it. So let's go to public comment unless there's other questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being patient. A few speaker slips. If you haven't filled one out, please do. Uh, Mr. Nelson or Miss Nelson? Ms., I'm sorry. Miss Nelson followed by Alice Lee. And three minutes if you say your name and your address if you're willing to do so. Ooh. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I have heard of Gail a lot. And uh, I've read a lot of your stuff. Um, so you actually are like a rock star in my world. <laughs> Believe it or not, I know. I'm sorry. You guys picked somebody. You did a good job in picking somebody. But I would advise you to do one thing, and then I'll tell you my name. Jody Nelson. I live in Walnut Creek, East Bay Neighborhoods for Responsible Technology. Make sure that you direct her. As good as she is, you guys are the ones who are making this and you guys do have some leeway, and push it as far as you can. That's my two cents. But um, I'm going to tell you about the ADA, which doesn't get discussed a lot. And the, the thing about the ADA is that um, you may be talking to your attorney and they may have given you some feedback to, about the ADA, but I can assure you that they're looking through it through a narrow lens, and because of that, you are not going to be in compliance. Um, I want to get some, identify some various details you should be aware of. The ADA was created in 1990 during the George Bush administration. Section 704 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act does not preempt ADA compliance. The ADA is not regulated under the FCC or health or environmental issues. This is a civil rights issue, and as, it names, as its name state, is a disability is a protection of civil rights for those who are disabled for various reasons. The ADA laws overrule any and all FCC laws and rules. The ADA does not specifically name all the impairments that are covered, and there's a reason. It's because they want this law to cover disabilities broadly without extensive analysis, and that is a legal term. But in September 2002, electromagnetic sensitivity was added to the ADA list. Like smart meters, these frequencies limit an individual from enjoying their lives in homes free of disabling effects, free from added impairment that these frequencies cause to their disability. Without ADA protection, it creates an access barrier to one's home and life. Without this protection, people like me would have no place to go, which is why you need to fully understand the implications of these small cells in relation to the ADA. In 2016, the Supreme Court looked at how they were considering compliance of ADA laws in response to an earlier Supreme Court decision that significantly narrowed the application of the definition of dis disability. From this, Congress enacted the ADA Amendments Act to restore the understanding that the definition of disability shall be broadly construed and applied without extensive analysis. If you place these cells near a home or facility where individuals with certain disabilities reside, I'm so sorry, um, this, is not, this becomes an access barrier and is not the least intrusive place for a small cell. Okay, if you I, I agree. I, I thank you for your time, and, and please, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask. Okay, thank, thank you. Any you. questions for the speaker, Vice Mayor Anderson? So, Ms. Nelson. Yes. I have a question. Okay. So what you're su suggesting is that we need to actually write something in the ordinance that 
installations shall comply with ADA requirements? Is that? The, the, the thing about the ADA requirements is they have not been specific to this technology. Right. So the only thing you have to go by is smart meters. And in the state of California, they did debate that. And that's why California has an opt out with smart meters, because people with disabilities needed that. So you can get an opt out without a disability, but with a disability, you opt out and you don't have to pay the fees and you don't have to pay the monthly charge because of that. So the ADA did come into play with that. And so we are now in new territory. This is, this is something that I can assure you, you are not looking at in the broad sense. You're, you're looking at, when you talk to your attorneys, they're looking at whether a wheelchair can, is going to be able to get around it. But these, it, it's kind of like the incommode, you know, how these things affect us in ways that we can't really see right now. And these are going to go into people's homes. These millimeter waves and the 4G uh, um, technology will go into people's homes. And right now, I can shut that off, which I do. I shut it off at night, and I, and I protect myself from these frequencies. But I will not have that ability with this. And that's where you have to come in at this, with this. And what you should do is find somebody that knows what they're talking about, and that there's not a lot of people that do. So I, I personally, I'm working with the, an ADA advocate who is helping me with this. She is the kind of person that she actually writes um, uh, law and, and in this area, so she would be able to help more than I can. But I can tell you that ha having been working with her, I know that cities are not approaching this very well. Okay, well, maybe you can give us the name of the person that you have, and you don't have to say it right now. You can give it to staff, and we can look into that. I appreciate the perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions for the speaker? No? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Alice Lee, followed by Nancy Hu. My name is Alice Lee. I live at um, 321 Iron Horse Court in Alamo. And um, I also, with Jody Nelson, um, represent this group, East Bay Neighborhoods for Responsible Technology. Um, from my address, you know I live in an unincorporated area of the county, and so uh, deployment of these facilities in my neighborhood is, is um, governed by the county wireless ordinance. And um, basically, we've had experience with permits already coming through over the last seven months and been at different levels of appeal. And I'm just hoping to share uh, our experience to the extent that it's helpful to you. Um, and my main point would be to urge you to, to do what you're doing, to delve into every possible way of the, ex the full extent of local government's power to set limits and guidelines on these before the permits come through, because that's not what happened at the county level. Um, they did not revise their ordinance, and, and through the appeal process, there were people in the planning commission who said, gosh, we think our ordinance should be revised. And you know, the momentum was difficult to stop at that point, and so these things have been approved, and, and the, the scope of the project is important to consider the numbers that you're talking about. The number that was given to Orinda for their area by one carrier was 87, and they've been tight-lipped usually about giving a big number. Um, they always, Verizon always um, denied any knowledge of a master plan in our area, but it, they, they, they've approved 12 right now. Um, and we believe more are coming because these are coming in phases. And so that cumulative effect should be taken into account as you decide what to do. Um, I would urge you to look at the measurements that you're talking about, the frequency of measurements. The county tried to uh, put a condition of approval for uh, annual emission measurements. Verizon appealed that by saying it was um, unlawful and unenforceable based on the Calabasas um, case. One item of case law, which the county council said was um, non-binding. It was in Superior Court, it is non-binding. So you don't have to follow that. Um, you can go more frequently in terms of measurements, and other cities um, have done that in their ordinances. Um, and there's a model ordinance available um, that our group has looked at um, online that we can make available to you as well that that's, specifies very specific things that you can do to protect 
uh, Lafayette and its citizens from the full implications and long-term implications of this. Um, we share the concern for there's no way to monitor the cumulative exposure from multiple carriers at this point. Um, and the FCC's levels are outdated. They're based on 1996 science, which was based on thermal effects of RF radiation. And all the data since then, um, there's overwhelming amounts of data that, that show effects that are non-thermal. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended that safe levels be reevaluated, and that has not truly been done. Um, but I leave these things with you to consider and um, commend you on the questions that you're asking. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for this speaker? Yeah, Vice Mayor Anderson. Ms. Lee, it'd be very helpful if you could, in fact, provide us with the model ordinance. I, I think. We're kind of under the gun, like the county was, uh, you know, but we have some knowledge, thanks to you and other folks that are here, that we can apply as we either rewrite or adjust things down the road. So if you could pass that information on to staff, that would be very helpful. I'd be happy to do so. Um, is there an email, or, or who, who do I? I think if you walk right over there, they'll okay. either take it from you now or give you an email address or okay. something. I've, I've so um, so the multiple carriers on the same poll, you say there's no way to monitor the cumulative. Don't they have to test, if a new installation comes in, don't they have to test their own equipment? Do they have to test it along with the other, other in at the same time or not? Do you know anything about that? I don't know for sure, but my understanding from what I've read is that because the, it, see, it just appears to me that the law says you can't deny Right, the 1996 federal law says you cannot deny placement based on, um, you cannot deny placement, or local government cannot affect uh, placement, construction, or modification of these facilities um, to the extent that the, that the emissions are below the FCC safe limit. So obviously if the, the, they are above that, right, you can do something, and so you wanna measure. Um, but I've heard things about how they cannot be placed on the same pole from different carriers, and so, and so, and, and that law applies to the placement of one facility. So one carrier can test their one facility and say, well, this is under the FCC limit. Right, so we that can was do what that. I was getting at, right? Yeah, like, that, that's my understanding of it. I haven't asked anyone, but that's what it, how it reads to me. Okay. And I feel like, as you're saying in the homes, something coming from that pole and that pole over there and the other carrier, no one's measuring that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Nancy Hu, followed by Caitlin McCormick. Hi, I'm Nancy Hu. Um, I live at 931 Mountain View Drive, Apartment B. Um, so good evening, I'm a resident of Lafayette since 2012. Uh, I have two young kids, you've met them, Aaron and Jeremy, three and five. Also a member of the Environmental Task Force, and I also come as part of the La Mirinda Families for Responsible Technology. Um, so like a lot of people have mentioned, I'm very concerned about the aspects of the 5G rollout, um, including the serious risks to um, our most vulnerable, which are our children and our elderly. Um, so I know that we can't, uh, under local control, say anything about health concerns, but that doesn't change that there are real health concerns, including brain cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, changes in sleep patterns, headaches, memory impairment, learning disabilities, the list goes on. Um, they're all outcomes from the RF and the microwave radiation that have been proven and documented. Um, furthermore, it is my understanding that the FCC has uh, let these private wireless companies off the hook for liability of medical issues as a result of these towers, which emit radiation 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So I hope our city can construct a responsible policy for the rollout of 5G small, tel uh, small cell towers in Lafayette that protect our community. Um, like Council Member Kendall had mentioned, looking at other um, other cities that are creating ordinances, there's Petaluma, Danville, Mill Valley. Um, they are all, a lot of them are talking about um, ways to space out the, um, the towers. Um, one of which I even saw Walnut City said that, um, and I encourage this too, is to make sure that there are no 5G telecommunication towers and antennas to be placed 1,500 feet from any school 
including nursery, elementary, junior high, and high school, any trail, park, or outdoor recreation area, any sporting venues or residential zones. Residential areas are where people live, sleep, and heal. So the data shows that proximity is a huge factor in risk due to EMF radiation. It isn't until 1,500 feet away from the source that the health risks of exposure equal the risk pool of the general public. I appreciate your careful consideration of this issue, and um, as a constituent, I just ask that you co collectively put your foot down and don't compromise on the values of our community for the benefit of a wealthy industry that is gambling with our health. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker, Vice yeah. Mayor Anderson? Ms. Hu, I think we're neighbors, so hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, you do realize the example you just told us about was about health effects of this radiation. I so know. the FCC has very neatly built a wall around I that know. issue. So I just want you to, I just want to confirm, that's my question, that you understand that we don't really have a way to make that the reason for doing things. Mm -hmm. There may be other reasons that we can come up with, mm -hmm. but you, you do understand that. I do. It's yeah. kind of forbidden fruit for us. I do. Okay. Yeah. We'll be creative, though. Thank you. All right. Okay, any other questions for the speaker? Now? All right. Thank so you. Wait, very wait. Much. So you said is it Walnut City? It was yes. one that said the. Yes. Um, and, and what was their reasoning? Health. I was it actually health, or what was was it? Something? I'm just wondering if it was something else. No. I don't think they put a reasoning on here. Let me look it up. Um, Maybe we don't put a reason. I looked at ehtrust.org, and EH Trust, okay. um, there's a bunch of different cities that have posted parts of their uh, ordinance that they've approved. And if I look up Walnut City, um, there's also a screenshot of their ordinance from their website. Um, they say telecommunication towers and antennas should not be located within 1,500 feet of any school, basically what I said. Um, and then it says to go see the code. They have a, a link. But yeah, I, I can't tell you right now what if they gave a reason for it. Okay. Um, but I saw that that was the the biggest feat that they, they gave in terms of distance-wise. Some of the other cities that I saw said 400 feet or 200 feet away from each other to kind of spread them out. Okay. And I know, I know fire departments have gotten themselves out. Right, firehouses. Really? They, they were yes. able to get themselves out. Yes, they yes. have a very strong lobby. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Caitlin McCormick. Hi, my name is Caitlin McCormick. I live at 972 Dolores Drive, Unit A. Um, so obviously we are not able to talk about health impacts or health effects, but we can talk about aesthetics in and of themselves. But there are a couple things with the legislation as we have it written now that I think may be modified. And my biggest health or biggest aesthetic concern comes with the stealth facilities. And when we take or define a stealth facility, we're going to take one of these towers and put it somewhere within the community and try and camouflage it as something else. In doing so, individuals don't know if they are by them or not by them. And we're also not, it might take away from the aesthetic impact that we are able to stand upon when trying to fight these from coming in. So if we are able to somehow limit the number of stealth facilities within the community, I don't know if that can be written in some way, or not encourage certain things, like they encourage uh, people to make them artworks or central landmarks, um, don't encourage that because then you're just again going to negate our entire argument of aesthetics. First of all, art's subjective, so let's not put that on there. And second, as a citizen, people are attracted to art and they're going to want to hang out there and I don't want to sit next to one of these. I understand that the health implication but also plays into the aesthetic aspect of let's put the best hands we can or put together the best hand and in doing so I think we need to remove the band-aids they can put on this aesthetics and make them what they are, and then we truly stand on a leg of, I don't want a thousand of these in my community, even if, sorry, um, you may say I want a thousand pieces of art in my community, but I don't want a thousand EMF towers or 5G towers, so uh, maybe modifying those guidelines with how we approach stealth ones, and then also I'm adamant about removing stealth from schools, 
they have no place being next to schools if we can get that litigation of 1,500 feet or not in there. But don't hide them. Make people see them. Make them know their kids are there because then you're going to present more of a fight later on. If this comes in, then sure, let's attack the FCC, but we need to have ground to stand on. Uh, Ripon in California, they put up a big enough fight that they were able to get a tower turned off because they had three cases of cancer in the same school. So we need to put forth the best presentation. So make them as ugly as they are so that we can basically use that against our aesthetics. And then what adverse events come after, we will have to fight those for what they are. But we need to know they're there. People in the community need to know they're there. And that's how we will continue to fight for more progress once or if implementation does come. Okay. So any questions? Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? OK, thank you very thank much. You. Do we have any other speakers for the topic? Uh, yes, Ms. Dawson, come on up. If you could, thanks. Hello, uh, Gina Dawson, 711 Los Palos Drive. I would just um, want to thank everybody who's come from other communities and, of course, within our community to talk about this. This is important. Um, I was just thinking of your creative standpoint and um, two things that came out. Is there any way we could put signage on some of these uh, towers to say just a, a kind of a warning label per, you know, our standards? Just a recommendation in terms of like, oh, this admits X amount if you're interested, something along those lines um, of VMF's emissions. The other thing is uh, I think a lot of these are going on to utility poles. And I'm wondering if there's a way we can be creative and say if it is, and pg is renting that space, making sure that um, they're in regulatory compliance with, <laughs> with the electrical utility um, uh, code. And that way you kind of make sure that that's the case so there's no leaning poles also with the 5G or 4G component to it. Just something to be creative and also kill two birds with one stone that we're <laughs> increasing maybe the safety of those utility poles as well. Um, even though it's probably an odd balance if you're adding these things back. <laughs> anyway, that was just a suggestion on the creative standpoint. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Okay, thanks, Ms. Dawson. If you could fill out a speaker slip, that'd be great. Do we have any other speakers? Okay, we'll bring it back to the council. Um, and so from what I've heard, and I'll, I'll let my colleagues weigh in here. I mean, there's been a variety of ideas that have been offered associated with the, with the urgency ordinance and components to that, and maybe some modifications that we could, we could make to that tonight um, and then pass, since it has to be passed before April 15th, and then on maybe then attack the ordinance itself if we want to. Um, and I know Vice Mayor Anderson had a couple questions about yeah. that. So, those are just my thoughts. Maybe we can we can discuss the urgency ordinance first. I know Councilmember Bliss had a, some ideas around those. I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, and we can all pull it up, pull it up, and review it, and take a shot at making some adjustments to what the Planning Commission has already done, and um, see if we can see consensus on that. Does that sound like a good okay. plan? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd ask uh, if there's any volunteers that would like to sort of go first as I type in my password here. Well, I, I printed mine out, so I'm ready to go. Oh, go for it. Thank you. Vice Mayor Anderson. <laughs> yeah, old school. <laughs> so I, I think ordinance, the ordinance would be the place to deal with things like the density of these units, or would that be in the resolution? That would be in the resolution. That would be in the resolution. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. Because the ordinance is short. Yeah, so the ordinance is one thing. The, resolu the resolution is easier to, main to change. Correct. The ADA question, is that an ordinance issue or a resolution issue? Resolution, resolution issue, too. Uh -huh. That will be a resolution That's issue. That's a resolution too. issue. Okay, so the distance from schools and uh, other places where there are concerned mm -hmm. Targets. Be all in the resolution. Okay, so generally these are resolution issues that Correct. we're talking about. Because these are guidelines, objective standards. Okay, so in the ordinance, I had one thing that I was wondering about, and I don't think there are page numbers here, but I'll see if I can find the section. 
This is in uh, 1508A1, or 1, minor modification, <clears throat> D, excuse me, 3D, 1508-3D. This is the new section that you've added. It's all red line? Yes. And basically the second to the last sentence, a representative of the project will be expected. Can we require their attendance as opposed to expect them to attend? I think the, the concern we may have is if they're not able to attend, then are we planning on denying it? Under what grounds? What would we do if they can't attend? Well, I'm thinking that maybe then we would have the ability to actually deny it. So I, maybe, are you saying that's not? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned that for their lack of attendance. I like the way you think. Yeah. What's that? I, would, I think we'd want more substantive grounds if there was questions that we had specifically that could not be answered from their submittal that required their attendance. That, that would be more as opposed to them just not being able to attend. Okay, so what you're saying is that if we had a condition that basically said if they weren't able to answer our questions, we would have grounds for actual if you think of it more in a in a land use contest, t take away the wireless aspect from it. Right. If if we had a, a housing project come forward and we wouldn't just deny it on the basis of the applicant not being able to attend, but that we needed specific um, concerns addressed, and if the applicant wasn't able to attend, those concerns wouldn't be able to be addressed. That's that's how I'm okay. seeing it. Okay. So let me think about that. So I will work on that. All right. The other one I've got is another couple of pages over. It's in 1509A D, last section of that red line strikeout where it refers to section 6-1508C3. It says requirements for modification to a wireless communication facility in the public right of way as set forth in section 6 1508 C3. Last sentence in the red line. Okay, I believe that should be 1512 C because there's kind of a circular reference that goes back and forth between the two. I know it's just my new shoe, but what the hell? It's okay, that's good. And push me for next one, then?
Maybe we can look into that if, yeah. if it is a correct. It's correction. just a correction. That's basically a typographical read, error. That yeah, we that can fix. section it refers you to six dash fifteen twelve C. I think it's twelve. Yeah. We'll double check for the correct Excellent. reference, and I think that that can be fixed. Okay, and then fifteen ten B. Last sentence right before C says wireless encroachment permit applications may not be subject to any public hearing requirement. Now, is that a F FCC requirement or why is that the case? Why wouldn't that be a public hearing? So it's, it, the FCC doesn't require you to go through any particular procedure. It's just a practical matter of the time it takes to notice and have a public hearing and and the shortness of the shot clock. Okay, so it's the shot clock is basically yeah. forcing us to not allow any public process because that takes more time. Have a public hearing, yeah. That was the determination. You just couldn't be done. I, I suppose you could have special meetings called or something, but it would... It, it's pretty difficult to meet the shot clock. Well, it's actually the zoning administrator who's doing it. Yeah. So I it just yeah. thought it would be possible to have a quick meeting to actually let people hear what's going on. But the worry is it would just take too much time. Is that the case? Yeah, the worry is that it would take too much time and we would not be able to meet the shot clock because the shot clock also has to um, accommodate any appeals. Okay. All right. That's all I have on the ordinance. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, that's on the ordinance. Do we want to go to the? Do we want to go to the resolution? I have ordinance. Are you, okay, go for um, it, Council so Kendall. Um, and mine's with the testing, so it's on page I guess seventeen. Is that? I'm thinking that's with the ordinance, all right? Page seventeen of twenty. So on uh, six, so one five one three. I. 1513. 1513, yeah. I. Standard conditions, I. So it's on page 17. Yeah, I've got a little mark there, but that's, yeah. Right, it says, um, RF emission monitoring, wireless communication facili facilities, whether operating alone or in conjunction with other facilities, shall not generate radio frequency emis emissions in excess of the standards, right? So. That I'm assuming that means that we do test them when they're all operating together. So when uh, the, uh, when they are required to submit when they submit an application and they do their first doing uh, a report to show that the proposed facility based on their modeling would comply with the FCC standards, they are supposed to consider. Uh, the cumulative impact, so they should be looking at what is in the environment around that facility, and then the report that comes out afterwards, uh, once it's operating, to confirm that it is complying would also be considering the other uh, emissions that are in the surrounding area. Right, and so this one does go on into that, and it says, there'll be an RF exposure report prepared by a professional engineer to the Planning Services Division. Um, do that's within one month after construction. Correct. And so that means that, like, I'm just making sure that we, we've captured that. So basically, they, you put something on, the whole thing has to be tested together, right? Right. That's and that, right. so you, we think that we've covered that one in here sufficiently. Yeah. The reports the, that, uh, that they're supposed to produce are supposed to think of the cumulative. Because if you think about it, you know, the general exposure, public exposure standards, that's assuming... You have no knowledge. You're not out there. You know, you know. You don't work in the industry. You're oh, just right. walking down the street or whatever, right? So it, it's it's uncontrolled. They call it uncontrolled exposure. You you're not. So that's where if you see on like a macro facility, they'll require that there be fencing around different things like that 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 protects uh, if there are exposures at the ground level. So the answer is yes. Cumulative. It's cumulative. Right. Um, is there a way um, for us to, because they, in a lot of their their documentation, they say they generally follow the IEEE, you know, FCC generally follows these other industry standards. Is there 
any way for us to say we want to adopt these other industry standards since they haven't covered all their bases. I mean, that's the problem. They haven't done it all. They, they try to cover themselves and say, well, we generally follow these other, the IEEE and, and everything. Is there a way that we can add that to make it just more objective in our own testing? I think any any attempt to establish any sort of standards at the local level will be met with the challenge that it's preempted by the FCC um, authority over these setting these standards. Okay, I'm just trying to think of other ways to get um, get the things tested in there that we really do want to get tested. Right, the fact that you want to have since they aim and they pulse, you know, you want to have all of the carriers at the same time doing the same thing. So you're really measuring how the thing is operating. Just wonder if there's any way we can pull in anything better than just saying, oh, an engineer's gonna go out there and test it, right? <laughs> is, there, is there anything more objective that we could put in there to enhance our ability to test it the way we wanna test it? Uh, I, 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 they, you you have now that the, it has to be certi I think certified by an RF engineer. So I mean that it's a professional test, uh, and so they are. Can we say under peak operating? You know, like under peak or the worst case scenarios, or you know, instead of just saying oh they go test it, it's like make sure that they're really testing it when it's really stressing out the system. Is there any way to do that? Like and have them test in a worst case scenario. Well, I know that uh, when they do the, uh, the, re the reports, the RF reports that are on the proposed facility, they model it to a worst case scenario. But I want to test uh, to that too. Right, so I think, uh, uh, I, I think that that is probably a requirement that now that they, they would have to test to a worst case scenario, they couldn't, couldn't not because it, remember we're talking about uh, exposures that you are kind of uncontrolled. So I haven't seen any other ordinances that contain any. I, I any haven't testing. I, I, I haven't right. seen every ordinance. There's probably one out there, or maybe there's a dozen out there that say something. Um, I, I'm just. Uh, I can't think of language that you could put um, necessarily in the ordinance. It doesn't mean, uh, remember, that when you, you're re requiring a report, doesn't mean that if when a report comes in, you, get, you could, couldn't get it evaluated and determined that it was inadequate, right? That the report needed uh, to be uh, improved or they didn't do the testing adequately or something like that. It may require in that instance that the city hire uh, their own expert to review it. I mean, the planning staff don't have that expertise. Right. Uh, but that that's typically the kind of thing I see uh, done where there are concerns that, um, you know, about the testing that's been done or they want to say. So you don't think up. we need to add anything to this? We just, when it comes, we... Right, you might want to have it, you know, have a, at least uh, at the beginning stages when you're starting to get these deployments is more new, uh, maybe you'd want to have an RF uh, expert review the reports okay. to assist the planning staff. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Councilman Kendall? Mm. Okay. Councilman Bliss? Yeah, I have two, uh, two thoughts, one sort of a question. Um, so looking at, to come back to this issue of, um, and if this is, the council's open to considering this, um, I'm looking for staff and legal counsel's um, guidance here too. If we're open to looking at the idea of sort of density of the deployment, spacing between um, the facilities as one way of getting at this while still conforming with the federal law. Um, it seems like, so if you look at page four, of the ordinance, this is section 6-1502, um, which, and then it's number, let's see, uh, I guess it would be M1. So it begins, small cell facility, and this is all red line, shall have the same meaning as, et cetera. And then it says the facility, and then if I'm reading this right, it looks like um, items one, 
uh, eye. mall eye, yeah. mm -hmm. eye. and right. so on right. are all basically attaching conditions um, to the facility in terms of uh, where it's mounted, um, the height of the mounting structure. It seems like that would be the place to maybe put something like that, like some sort of quantitative stipulation as to spacing? Um, that is actually the definition of a small cell facility. Oh, I see. Okay. Great. So I think uh, the spacing requirement should actually go in, in the, the resolution, the resolution uh, okay. where okay. the objective standards are for how to deploy them. Oh, great. Where Could you point us to where that So would? that would be the resolution that is attached, resolution uh, 2019-16. Okay. So that's... Uh, so you have the oh. ordinance, the urgency ordinance, and then after that is the resolution in terms of order. Right. Okay. And we would suggest either um, including that in the locations for installation uh, under that heading or uh, design standards for all facilities, either of the two. Okay. Um, and so I guess my what follows up, thank you for that, first of all, for clarifying that. Um, so I guess what would follow on that is we'd be looking at wanting to create um, something that's quantitative and would regulate the density or what we're calling the aesthetics um, of the overall deployment. But as I understand it, we couldn't, we need to make sure that whatever standard we set up would not make the network inoperable, right, is what I understood was said earlier. In other words, we couldn't make it so it was non-functional as a deployment, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's correct, but that it, that's the the kind of the problem with what the FCC has tasked local governments to do is you're supposed to make objective standards, but everyone has a different network and needs different locations. So how do you do that? And yeah. and so uh, it, I think one one way to approach it is you you set a standard, and if someone can't meet it, then they you know they have to request an exception basically, or ask for you to rethink it or reconsider it. But in a vacuum, it's hard, right. you know, to make. So we were, we, um, we heard that there were, you know, various uh, concerns about spacing mm -hmm. issues for the clutter reasons and other aesthetic reasons. And so, we, you know, we could put something in that would have a spacing requirement. Yeah, may, maybe I'd just jump in to um, execute on some action here. What under location, that would be under locations for installations? Either either that or design standards for all facilities. Those are the two kind of areas. We could do it either way. Okay. So um, could we ask for your help in maybe coming up with a sentence? Yeah. We were and recommending 500 feet. Okay. So tell us center. exactly where you'd put it and exactly what you'd say. Or Councilmember Blessfield, I didn't mean no, to. I didn't mean to override no, 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 it. No, no, you, yeah. you took it exactly the right. We recommend putting it under the uh, design standards for all facilities. Okay. What page? Uh, I'll put, wait, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. So it's on page two of six, and it would be on three of six, number 13. Would be spacing, or I don't know how you want to word it. Yeah, I think you can just call it spacing of facilities. Okay, so it would go under design standards for all facilities. And it would be a new number. Number 13. Number yes. 13. Mm -hmm. And what exactly would, um, and it would be spacing. Right. And then what would we, what would we say? So the, the issues here, so we're talking about the public right of way. So sometimes uh, localities say, you know, like a linear distance, but that you, or the alternatives is sort of a linear distance or sort of in the radius because sometimes you have mm -hmm. street lights on one side of the street, you have utility right. poles on the other side of the street. Yeah. So those, those you could say uh, uh, spacing requirement of, you know, there should be only 
you know, no more than one facility within, or um, I don't know if you'd say no more, you, uh, there should be a minimum space of 500, you know, within a 500 foot radius, no more than one facility within a 500 foot radius, or you could say uh, 500 linear feet along the right of way, those are sort of the two formulations that I see. Or you could say there, there could be no, no plated no closer than 800 feet of another cell. You could say it like that, yeah, and then that would be, that would be That's just where either way. It, it may yeah. be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 800 or 500? 800. 800. Okay. So are we are we good with 800? Where I mean, we're, we're sure. yeah. Uh, I think th this is all subject to waivers. So. Okay. Yeah, I guess you were talking don't... about 400 yeah. feet. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so. that it's 500 to 1,000, and yeah, you're splitting somewhere kind of in there. Some okay. fifty. Be a minimum spacing of 800 feet. Yeah. Minimum spacing between facilities of 800 feet. Correct. Okay. Great. Okay, minimum spacing in a facility. Yeah. Okay. Is is that be is, would that be per carrier or? That'd be for, per, per facility. facility. Per now, so what's people would be allowed to co-locate? Well, yeah, you could co-locate because that would be one facility. I mean, that's okay. why I, that's why I read the definition, right? If you co-locate, that's one facility. Facility is that correct? Okay. Yes. Am I mixing my definitions? I'm getting no. Out. You're not mixing your definitions. But <laughs> so the FCC, in its wisdom, has two definitions of co-location. Okay. So well, they now say if you want to place a wireless facility on an existing structure, that's a co-location, even if it has no wireless on it. Uh, but separately, they also say it's co-location if there's an existing wireless facility and you want to add wireless mm -hmm. to it. So if you put uh, that there should be a minimum spacing of 800 feet between wireless facilities just writ large, I think that would cover, that wouldn't prohi prohibit co-location. Right, co-location can still occur, but. Yeah. Any, both types of co-location. But they would not be any closer than 800 feet. Right, yeah. right. So yeah, the, the balance here uh, where there are spacing requirements is sometimes the pole that gets picked gets kind of cluttered, but the, that's also dealt with uh, in the other requirements. Uh, for the aesthetics and d the design. Okay. See, this isn't that hard. Okay. This is one more. So yeah, so I think we're, I th are we all good with that one? <laughs> yeah. You can just shake your head, that'd be great. Okay, go back to Councilmember Bliss has another one. Yeah, and just, this is kind of jumping way back now to like the whereases of the uh, ordinance. Um, and this is wordsmithing I realize, but I really, um, you know, this is, these, when we adopt these ordinances, they're sort of our statement as a council of our view of the world and mm -hmm. sort of why we're doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm not going to like push for this too hard if people think I'm just being grumpy. But um, if you look at the whereas is where it talks about. Um, Which one is it? Yeah, sorry, it's the on ordinance it's the 673, ordinance. which I think oh, is. 673. Yeah. The other one. That's the main well, one. Well, I'm going to suggest the change to both because I think it's in both. Bear with me here. Sorry. Okay, 674 we need to do tonight. Yep, let me get to that one. 673 is let me get to got 673. time. Second I think it I think it applies to both. Hold on a second. Yeah. 674 then. Okay. Thank you. Um, which whereas? Although it'll apply to both. It'll be one, two, three. It's the, is it the same? fourth. Fourth. Whereas. Yeah. It's a different whereas than the first one, but it says Whereas significant changes in federal laws that affect local authority over wireless communications facilities have occurred, et cetera. I want to change effect to limit. So I want to specifically say that significant changes in federal laws that limit local authority over. And I know it's not a substantive change, but I think, again, these are our cool. statement of our views of the that's policy cool. context as we see it, and I think that's an important that's good. change. And if you go back to, I know we're not doing this one tonight, but just on 673, I think it's the second whereas, there's the same phrasing. So I just, I think it's, the more we've learned about these FCC, these new regs, I think it's important for us to stipulate that we see them as limiting, not just affecting local authority. So this would be, um, Which? in 673, this is? Third whereas, I believe. 
Uh, yeah, there's a third whereas. Time is. Yeah. That's it. That's all I have. Okay. So it's a third whereas. It's it's it's, it's verbatim, verbatim, right? Yeah. Six mm -hmm. seven. Just changing six, seven, the effect three. of limit. Changing the effect of limit. Okay. 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 Anything? Else? That's it. Okay. Councilmember Geringer, did you have any or? Turn it back on. So I know Council Member Kandel was reading in that same area about the requirements and the testing and um, on compliance with that. And so I'm not seeing it, and it could be my eyes are crossing, in the um, resolution on um, where we would be able to even have a discussion about adding in. I know it's one month after construction, and I assume that happens every time anybody build, installs a new thing in that location, every 800 feet, and then every three years from that. Um, but that's in the ordinance, right? It's Not in the, in the emergency resolution. So I don't it know. Is, it is oh. in the emergency. It's in the emergency it's ordinance, the ordinance. Yeah. and the regular ordinance, but not in the uh, standards. Okay, thank you. And so then I guess, does it change anything for us and does it make sense to have it be in the standards as we're going forward? Or will we have an opportunity when this comes back to us for review and looking at model ordinances and things like that to look at that? So do we want it to be more often? Do we gain anything uh, well, from that's that? Good, that's a good question. I think. Okay, well, I was going to say while we're doing that, I know I think Vice Mayor Anderson might have also been um, asking to look at the um, maybe everybody was, but um, the distances from schools. Yeah. Um, and I don't. I'm happy, of course, to have us look at adding it in tonight in the urgency. Um, I don't know about the whole because I haven't seen the language from the city of Walnut, but the. Um, I think what Nancy who had said was 1,500 feet from schools, trails, you, everything. And I'm wondering if at least we start in the place of uh, schools and where the, where the council is on that or where um, the attorneys are on that. Yes, I think a question for uh, our legal yeah. staff. The, the, the idea I, I thought it, it seemed yeah. a lot for us to consider tonight, but maybe schools and preschools, things like that. So uh, one of the concerns would be on what basis if we were yeah. Yeah. thinking exactly. of the that key. this is right. for aesthetic <laughs> regulation, is there aesthetic, you know, there was a, um, you know, ban in certain areas where, of the city where it was like the mm -hmm. decorative street lights and things like that, but so it would be right. subject to some risk obviously, if uh, legal risk, if you were to impose a ban uh, that was just related to um, schools, unless you had a justification that had something to do with aesthetics. So the one thing I was looking at was the ADA question, right. and maybe yeah. that gives I did see that. That was my a second. little angle. Yeah. And we have a statement in here already in the, in the resolution. No, this is under design standards right. five. Right, I saw that. Maybe what we want to do is kind of pop that out, either in its own statement or put it at the beginning. I don't know, just and, to make and it. And don't just talk about it without in, um, interferes with emergency operations or pedestrian or vehicles. So make it more about disability. That's what I'm saying. Right. Either make its own number or put it at the top and then let the other ones fall behind it. I don't know. 
but that might be mm -hmm. easier for you know, in terms argument. of schools and impact on yes thank you you, you follow me yes I do thank so you. I mean I could we could either flip it or make it another section doesn't matter Whatever. I, I would suggest making it another section actually okay. but um, I don't know staff if you've got or if, Mike if you've got an idea on specific language well it's here and just just car just carve it out yeah, just add it. Yeah, you've got it right here. So five so says five, a wireless yeah, communication right facility shall not be located within any portion of the public right of way that interferes or may interfere with the city in emergency operations or pedestrian and vehicular access. Next, Next paragraph. Next. All wireless communication facilities and associated equipment in public right of way shall comply with Americans with Disability Act ADA requirements. And why does that have to only be public right of way? We could change that. Yeah. Okay. So. Do you have a comment? Does, do we have a <laughs> legal comment on? On making that number six? So yeah. do you, Yes. I, so sorry. we have two things on the table still, right? Right. It, it doesn't have to be just public right of way, but I believe that the, these standards are applying only to the public right of way. They're applying only in the public right of way? Yeah. ADA requirements? No, these standards. Oh, these on standards. On these wireless. Oh, right. This list, this resolution. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take the public right of way out of the statement and we'll let people figure that out. Oh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> that's good, yeah. See, the thing about this resolution, we can change this. Yeah. This yeah. Easy to modify. We don't have to get everything in there, but, but we're doing good stuff, there's no doubt. Okay, so that that would. So that adds a new paragraph, so the numbering has to change, basically. And then what about the schools? Do you want to go back to that, Teresa? Is there any way to fit that in? I'm thinking that we're picking we're picking that up in there, and then we can look at it again and find out about the other ordinances right. and things like that. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other, yeah. Yeah. The the question about. Um, the standard condition that says that the, there will be an administrative review at three-year intervals is actually in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. So we can certainly change that to annual review sure. if, if that's what we want to do. Yeah, let's go to annual. Mm -hmm. Annual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, my question is one of administration here. When we when we make when we come to a motion, are we going to have to call all of these out specifically, or is staff confident that we've? I think we're confident that we've captured the changes. I'm looking at Pyle, and she's nodding. So my blood I think my if, blood pressure was going up a little. Bit. So, <laughs> so I think okay. if if you are ready at some You're point, too young for that. <laughs> it's going to be. Um, you know, adopting the urgency ordinance as amended tonight. Okay. A, a, as well as um, introducing the uh, traditional ordinance as amended tonight and adopting the resolution as amended tonight. Okay. Um, I have an idea on ordinance 673. Okay. Maybe I'll just pose it since we're not under the, or maybe we are, and I'm just, I'm blanking on it here, under the gun to introduce it tonight. For, and then move it for its second reading on April 22nd, is that we form a, commit, a committee and have that committee meet and possibly get you on the line and kind of go through it, take a look at this, perhaps this model ordinance that was suggested earlier in the evening, and, and to kind of go through it. I mean, I don't think we're going to be able to do that tonight here, and then bring that back on April 22nd for the, for the first reading. Um, I would just pose that it, t timeline wise is that ex is that acceptable the second so the second reading would be delayed second was yeah the second reading would be delayed hearing April 22nd might be an aggressive time frame that we may want to do it farther I, back I, I miss I'm sorry Mel, I missed the first part oh that it may be aggressive to meet the April 22nd time frame I think I think what you're Suggesting is a is appropriate. It's just that the timing of when we introduce the ordinance may be aggressive, in order to accomplish all of that. Yeah, we'd have to bring it. We'd have to bring it back on April twenty second. 
It would right. be introduced on April and 22nd. It would be introduced on April 22nd. So I, I think we would suggest if you want to do that is moving forward with the urgency ordinance mm -hmm. and resolution, the, but pushing back, uh, not bringing it back on April 22nd, maybe bringing it back in May. Yes, yeah, the, 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 the urgency ordinance and resolution, we would okay. hopefully agree on tonight mm -hmm. and pass, but on ordinance 673, I'm sorry, I should have been more clear, on 673, mm -hmm. We would introduce that on April 22nd after the committee met. No, I think we're thinking that's too aggressive to make too that quick. deadline. It's okay. too quick. Oh, okay. We're, we're not going to be able Continue. to accomplish well, we, all okay, of that we can, we'll, okay. functionally so, this week, right? In yes. Got it. So to okay. do that. Go ahead, Pyle. Here, yeah. No, that's exactly what I was trying to say because we'll have to reconvene these, this week to be able to publish next week and be oh. on the 22nd. Okay, so we can, we can push that back to First May. Week. First, me first meeting in May. You could continue it to a date certain, whether yeah. it be May 13th or, w as long as we've got the urgency ordinance in yes. place, we're covered. That's so what, that's what, so that's saying. what I'm saying is that we have more time. Okay. And so we don't need to rush to, to get the, the introduction of the ordinance, if, especially if you're thinking you wanna do some more substantive changes. Okay. So that's what I was thinking. And I'll just look to my colleagues at that. Let's just talk, let's just talk about Ordinance 673 and pushing that back and forming a subcommittee to tackle that. Is everybody on board with that idea and pushing back the introduction of that ordinance to sometime in May, maybe the first meeting in May, having the subcommittee meet during that time and utilizing our council um, to answer questions? Okay. Second, is everybody okay with that? Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. The second question is who would like to be on that subcommittee? <laughs> okay. Councilmember Candell and Vice Mayor Anderson, is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Okay, so do we need a motion or voting on that or anything? We're just checking to see if Gail is available. I'm, I don't know if you would want okay. her to attend. It would be the, the May 13th meeting. She's not available, which, so I don't know if you wanted Gail to be able to attend. Yeah, I think, I think we probably would. Yeah, it would be May good. May 28th. Yeah. Twenty seventh is Memorial Day. Otherwise, June tenth. If it's if it's all right, I know it's a little bit out, but uh, would June twenty fourth work? Gail would be able to attend. I mean, my personal feeling is we should. Do this right, so I, I'm I'm fine with that date. If yeah. the subcommittee's okay. fine Absolutely. with it, that's a city council meeting, right? That'd be a city council okay. meeting, yeah. Because we would be introducing the regular ordinance, and and to the extent um, if there were significant substantive changes, then we would need to go back to planning, planning commission. Sure. So that might give us, give us you know time. time to okay, so I think we're good on <laughs> on six seventy three. So now if we go back to the urgency ordinance and resolution, we've made some changes. Um, the staff feels comfortable with those changes that we've made. Do we have additional changes that we wanna make? Cause we've, this is our only shot at it tonight. I, I'd be happy to move adoption as modified. Second. Okay, so we've got a motion and a second. So do we have further discussion? Okay, so we'll go ahead and call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 So it's unanimous. Thank you very much to and staff. And so was that for the, the urgency oh, ordinance and so the resolution as well? Yes, do we have a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. And that's oh. as amended. As amended. As, as, amended. as, as amended. amended. As amended. <laughs> You guys are detail-oriented. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have a motion <laughs> on the <laughs> as amended. We have a second, second from Councilmember Geringer. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay, I'll call a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. And then lastly, if we can have a motion to continue the yeah. public <laughs> hearing of the traditional ordinance to June 24th. So moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous on that as well. All right, have we done? Everything there? Great. Got a lot okay. of damage. Thank you very much to all of you. Very, very much. Okay. Um, items removed consent calendar. We did not have any. Council commission reports. Anybody 
like to Vice Mayor Anderson. Well, I was mentioned earlier by the city manager, uh, Councilmember Candell, Geringer, and myself, and Ms. Srivatsa all attended the mayor's conference. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a very good presentation on rats and other vectors. <laughs> and mosquitoes. And, and mosquitoes. And critters. <laughs> well, when we got past that, we got into a real interesting conversation about MTC, the Casa Compact. It was very good. Dinner that followed afterwards, the, con the discussion continued. So it was a really very good meeting. And I right. think uh, we got a lot of connections and a lot of, you know, eye contact with other cities who are right. interested in pursuing this thing. So thanks for going. A lot of, there a lot of good uh, ground was covered there. Yeah. Great showing for our city. Yeah. That's great. Okay, any others? Uh, okay, um, I've got a few. First, um, so for our CCCTA um, liaison representatives, given the, the nature of the meetings on, I believe they're two, on Tuesday mornings at 9.30. Thursdays. Thursday, sorry, to get the T's yes. mixed up. Um, our, it's very, very difficult for working council members to make those meetings, which I completely understand. So um, what we've done, or what I've done is I've asked former Mayor Tatson, this is, this is a liaison position, does, does not require a council member uh, to, to fill the role. Um, and Mr. Tatson, former Mayor Tatson actually approached me before he left the council and said, hey, I'm willing to help any way I can. So anyways, I did ask him if he'd be willing to fill the role. He got permission. Um, and he's willing to do it. So um, I've gone ahead and asked him to do it. Hopefully everybody's okay with that. Absolutely. Okay, great. <laughs> um, second one is, um, I know there's not many people here. We're gonna adjourn in a minute. We're not gonna adjourn. We're gonna move to closed session in a minute, but I will, when we come back, I'm gonna adjourn the meeting in honor of Don Black, who was the first mayor of Lafayette, who recently passed. So I just wanted to, to, to have that on the record here. Um, and I understand from our communications analyst that um, Jeff Heyman, that Jeff did a, did a video, an interview of former Mayor uh, Black that he's gonna have uh, published on our YouTube site or the city site sometime this week. So we'll get that out. I think that should be really fun um, to, to listen to and interesting. And finally, I have a statement to make. There's nobody here, so I'm just gonna read it. That way it'll be it'll be. There's on, people here. It'll be on the, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that, is so that is so rude. That is so rude. I apologize. I'm so sorry to both of you. Um, gosh, I know. And like two very important people personally to me. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'll tell you. I, I, I apologize. Um, so uh, worst, worst kept secret in town here. Heavy heart, big time for me personally. I'm announcing tonight that I'll be stepping down as mayor. Uh, effective uh, April 20th, um, but I will remain on the city council um, as a council member and I will complete my four-year term uh, on the council. Um, and it's just been, I'll just say, it's been an incredible uh, short time, about four months, four and a half months. Um, it seemed like longer, but I've just really cherished the time with the community and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Um, I have been given a very unexpected, tremendous opportunity in my professional life. That's the reason for this, and I, I wanna be clear on that. And it would be a disservice to the community if I were to remain as mayor, delivering to the position in the community anything less than 100% around commitment and effort. So that's why I have chosen to do this. In addition to, and this is most importantly in my life, the ability to spend time with my family. So with a new position comes a lot of commitment and um, you know, we have some critical time with my kids and my wife and I'd like to, like to take advantage of those years and those are the, those are the two reasons that I'm, that I'm doing this. Um, like I said, you know, and then there's no more important value I think than being a good and loving dad and spouse. I think um, priority wise I'm, I believe in that very strongly. So I've really cherished my time over these past few months. Uh, grateful for the community for, for putting your trust and confidence in me and having a ton of coffee with me. Um, you know, we came off a turbulent election, election period, and I think we all really tried to bring some positivity to 
uh, our jobs and all, all five of us, I think, have done a really good job as a, as a team while still maintaining our independence uh, in the way we vote and how we debate and then how we move on and tackle the next issue in always the best interest uh, to the community. And that's a Lafayette tradition that I've, see, I've seen continue here over the last four and a half months. And I've just been proud to be a part of it, um, sitting just in this seat. And we're all in the same seat. We're all, we're all equal here. So, um, you know, I think we've accomplished quite a bit over the last four and a half months, just, just thinking back from, you know, our open space purchase to, um, you know, where we're moving perhaps in the flavor tobacco product uh, area to a lot of other issues. We've we've done a lot over the last four and a half, five months, and I, I do believe the strategies and the objectives that we're going to deliver will make an impact on the city. I do believe that concentrating on what's happening in Sacramento in terms of protecting our local control is is really something that we're all kind of banded together on uh, in a smart in a smart way. Um, so you know, in addition to thanking truly thanking our residents here personally and our business community, which I've gotten to know very, very closely. And it's just been a real pr privilege to, to get to know um, our, our commerce uh, area of town. Um, I'd like to especially thank Interim City Manager Naroop and our City Attorney Mala and our City Clerk Joanne um, and the entire staff. I, I, Tracy's here, obviously, and, and Greg's here, and uh, just the entire staff has been um, fantastic. And I, you just you take on a role like this as a volunteer, you don't know what to think. I'm new at this still, and you have this support structure behind you that has been fantastic. And there are they are so I just want to say this one more time they are so devoted to this city, to the people of this city that it's just, it's unreal. They come to work every day. I've spent a lot of time in the office with a positive attitude and they deal with complex, incredibly complex issues and they do it fairly and transparently. And I've never once questioned the integrity of our staff, never once. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I've just been really, really proud to work together with all of you. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, So with that, I think um, I'd like to just thank my colleagues um, and for your support. And um, I will, uh, again, like I said, serve as mayor uh, until April 20th. And then at our next meeting on April 22nd, um, we'll agendize uh, what we need to, to to move forward in terms of leadership on the, on the council. That's appropriate to, to say. So that is my announcement for the evening, and that is all I have. So, okay, is there any other uh, comments or um, things that we wish to agendize for future meetings before we go into closed session? I think, I think we did want to bring the Townsend matter back. We have, we have that one, um, and I think, that is it. Any others? No? Okay. All right. With that, let's uh, go ahead and move into closed session, and we'll come out and report on closed session when we're finished. Thank you. And if we, we yeah, let's take a two-minute break or five-minute break if you need to. I wish there were a way you could make this work, Cam. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'll still be here. It's just a different seat. We just need to clone you. That's, that's the time for the, yes, you did so well, yes, you did. Thanks for doing this. I owe you. It's, it's all right, man. It's all right. That is gratitude. You got your priorities in the right place. So where did you get those sodas from? You know, we buy them. We get them at Whole Foods. And they're on, they're on uh, Amazon okay, discount. All right, you, get a, you get a great, uh, great deal on Okay. And there, it's just water. Yeah, uh, it's with yeah, flavor, with a little know, flavoring. Like, yeah. yeah. No okay. Sugar. All right. Well, unless
Tove Karoline Knutsen